I'm Lawrence Krauss, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. My guest this week is Elizabeth Colbert, the Pulitzer Prize winning writer of The Sixth Extinction and a, a staff writer for The New Yorker who writes about largely about science and human affairs, uh, particularly climate change and uh, issues associated with modern technology. Her writing is infused with uh, both a fascination and excitement about science and an ability to meet and, and interview very interesting people from around the world. Her most recent book, uh, Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future, is a fascinating discussion of basically how humans are needing to develop technological solutions for problems that technology has created and the opportunities, challenges, and frustrations associated with that. And she has talked to people around the world about a a number of very interesting and sometimes tragic conundrums. I wanted to chat with Elizabeth about that book and also about her own development of an interest in science as someone who who uh, study literature uh, rather than science and where that came from and uh, and how and the importance of really science for understanding public policy and 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 our culture so we had a, a remarkable discussion about uh, about these topics and an in-depth uh, dive into her new book and I hope you'll enjoy our discussion Elizabeth by the way will be joining us on our Galapagos Origins Project Foundation trip in January 2024. So stay tuned for announcements about that. In any case, I hope you'll enjoy watching the podcast on our Substack site, uh, Critical Mass, where you can watch it uh, commercial free. And by doing so, support the nonprofit Origins Project Foundation that produces the the podcast. Or you can um, watch it uh, on YouTube or listen to it on any... uh, podcast listening site. Whether you watch it or listen to it, I hope you'll really enjoy this discussion with Elizabeth Colbert. Well, Betsy, it's wonderful to see you again, and I want to thank you for taking time out um, to uh, of, of your busy schedule to uh, spend some time with me virtually. It's, it's great to see you again. Likewise. And... Um, I'm going to get to ask you questions about things that I, that I've always wondered about you. So now I'm, because this uh, this is an origins podcast, and one of the things I like to do is is talk to people about the origins of how they got to where they got to before we actually talk to where where you've gotten to. And I'm fascinated by your origins because they don't seem, as far as I can see, to pre- have prepared you for the incredible success. Well, in one way they have, but but for the subjects of your incredible success as a writer most recently you um you grew up in in uh in, in larchmont or for the most part in, in near new york um some um, a nice feeder school to yale and you went to yale and of course at yale you studied literature what else do people study at yale and um and and uh i was pleased actually you went to yale you fortunately left yale a year and a half before i moved there to become a professor there. Well, it's too yeah. bad because I actually did take a physics class, and it was it was kind of a debacle. I still have remember the final. Um, <laughs> yeah. Was it a real physics class or was it physics for? Yeah, poets? it was a real physics class. I I was really stupid, and I took like the real pre med physics class. I I oh. was. It was oh, a oh, big, oh. big boo boo. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, no. And of all the physics classes, you should never take pre med physics is the one you should definitely never take because it it's, insane. yeah, it's not taught like regular physics. They're trying to get, and then you have these students who are all, anyway. I once yeah. taught that class at Yale and I vowed I'd never teach it again. But yeah. uh, I used to teach the physics for poets class, but you, I thought yeah, maybe I that might have been the one that. you would take. I should have taken that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. I might, be, I might be a physicist today. Yeah. You, you never know. But you took that. Were you thinking of being a doctor? Is that why you took the pre-med? No, I, I was interested in, um, you know, I was interested in science. And I, um, I, but I was not well enough prepared by my very kind of mediocre high school education. So um, I was immediately blasting out of the sciences. <laughs> now, hold uh, on. It's too bad, too bad. You said you were interested in science. So what kind of literature did you focus on when you did when you studied literature? I studied um, German literature. I was, a, um, it was, it was yeah, it's it was called a lit major. It still exists. It's not exactly conflict. It's not exactly English. It's it's its own thing. It was very heavily theoretical in those days. It was as 
you know, Yale was just a hotbed of deconstruction at that oh, yeah. time. And you survived so, that. I survived. I'm a, I am a survivor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. No, I remember we used to look down from Science Hill at those deconstructionists and laugh and claim it would never, science would never, never be affected. But then, it's, yes, and yes. Then look what's happened. But anyway, yeah, yeah that that's right. It, like a cancer. It, but anyway, um, so, okay. So German literature. And did you take any other science classes? Um, how did I fulfill my requirements? I don't think I ever went up Science Hill again. No, I think yeah. I. Yeah, that's the case. Most students at Yale never even have to go up Science Hill once. But yeah, uh, I, but, uh, I think I just used AP credits or something. I can't but, remember. So then you graduate, and this explains. So if you, I was trying to figure out why after you graduate, you went a Fulbright scholarship to Germany to Hamburg, and it's because you'd studied German literature. Is that the reason you went? Yes, exactly. Did you plan to go on and in, in, in to graduate school or something, or did you uh, at that time? Why did you why did you why did you go to Germany? I mean, other than the excitement of getting a scholarship to go there. Well, that's a. Uh, I mean, I you know this is <laughs> this is perhaps more than your listeners <laughs> want to hear, but I I had my my grandparents. My mother was born in Germany, and uh -huh. was, my grandparents were German refugees from and. Uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, sort of waking up, I suppose, to my own family's history. And that made me study German um, and study German literature and go to Germany for a year. And um, I did entertain thoughts of going on and, you know, really getting a PhD in German literature, but not really terribly serious ones. I, I kind of... I toyed with it, but I never, you know, I never actually applied to grad school. Well, right? now was the fact I noticed, at least in your biography, it says you became a stringer for the New York Times of Germany. Did that, did you seek that out or did that happen? To, is that sort of help derail you, actually having a job derail you from going back to school? Yes, yes, exactly. I, I instead of going to class in European universities, people don't go to class that much and no mm. one went to class. You just had to sort of be there for the end of the semester so mm. instead of going to class i um did i i wrote a bunch of stuff i wrote stuff for the times travel section i was a stringer for the times could you I, explain what a stringer is by the way sure a stringer is um you know there was at that point you know one correspondent he was in bun in those days and you know he couldn't be everywhere so for example that was the year that um they were the Reagan administration was putting Pershing missiles in uh, in Germany. And there were a lot of demonstrations, pretty fierce demonstrations. So, you know, I would go out and cover the demonstrations in Hamburg and then I would just feed it. I would just, uh, I guess, probably feed it to the recording room. In those days, you would call up and, you know, just dictate your notes to someone and, and they would pass them on to the um, person who was actually writing the story. So that's okay. a stringer. It's that's a, a stringer, basically. Eyes and ears, basically. Okay, string people along. Okay, um, but then and and then you you know worked at the Times for quite a while in the Metro desk and everything else. And but and then you eventually moved to the um, to the New Yorker in what 1999, I think. Now I was yeah. going to ask why, but I suppose the New Yorker is kind of a dream job. Is that the reason, or or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that. Um, you know, everyone in journalism, everyone who writes, you know, 800 words or a thousand words, you know, as you do at the Times wants to write, um, you know, 10,000 words and everyone wants 10,000 words, wants to write 100,000 words. So I guess everyone always thinks they have more to say and, uh, then, and then maybe they do. But anyway, I thought I had something to say too that was beyond the thousand word scope. And uh, so I, as soon as I, got the offer i i you know knew i would take it yeah what if you don't let me ask you what what preceded getting that an offer i mean you're working at the metro desk and and uh and and i don't know that that doesn't sound to me it doesn't sound like a sort of a launching pad for a kind of thoughtful writing career so what um it was just people liked your writing in the times is that is that was well, I had been writing something called the Metro Matters column, which doesn't oh. exist anymore, but which was local politics. And um, 
I was actually hired at the New Yorker by David Remnick, um, mm-hmm. who had just become the editor of the New Yorker, to revive a local column, a local politics column that had been called um, Around City Hall. Yeah. I think it was called yeah. Around yeah. City Hall, um, and it had been written by a woman named Andy Logan, who had just sort of retired, and it had the the column had sort of you know, just drifted into oblivion. And 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 David had the idea of reviving it when he became editor. And so since I had been writing this column, I was a somewhat natural oh, sure. choice. Okay, that explains it. Yeah. Now, then, and then that led uh, five, five years or so later to your first book, Prophet of Love, which seemed to me, to, it's a story about, pol- about politics, isn't it? Or, you know, politics. Yeah, and- that, that book is actually really a, uh, a collection of stories about New York politics, almost all of them about New York politics, some sort of ancillary to that, but that were written in that in that period of the first years that I was at the New Yorker. Okay, yeah, that, and then, but then this is the thing that's a, that gets me. There's like a phase transition, not a catastrophic <laughs> extinction, but yeah, but something like it. 2004, you do that, and then 2006, you come out with field notes from a catastrophe, which is the beginning you know, presages the obvious the beginning of what is what is what you're most well known for and what you've continued to do, which in some sense is right about science and nature. What caused that shift? Or I mean it must have been percolating for some time, I assume. Well, it had a you know, it has like all origins, they're a little bit fuzzy and multifaceted, I suppose, but one thing that happened was um, that the web took over the news, you know, right around the time I got to the New Yorker. And so you had to kind of rethink things um, because, you know, we're, we were weekly, we close on, you know, close stories, let's say on Thursday, they won't come out till Monday. Um, the political churn was getting really, really fast. and I started to think of things to do that, you know, wouldn't be dated by the time they came out. And I have always been um, interested, even when I covered, you know, politics, I covered a lot of environmental issues, environmental politics, the closing of, for example, the Fresh Kills landfill on Staten Island, things like that, um, PCBs in the Hudson. And I had this idea right as as um george bush withdrew from the kyoto protocol you know in 2001 Mm -hmm. that i would try to write something on um climate change and i actually went to greenland in 2001 and Mm -hmm. um that made a big impact on me and then i filed my piece on greenland literally on september 10th september september 10th 2001 (laughs) so uh you know, it, it didn't run for months. It obviously got, mm-hmm. you know, shoved yeah. aside yeah. by the events of September 11th. We all, everyone at the New Yorker got really thrown into September 11th coverage, including me for a year, really. And when I emerged from that, I proposed a piece to David Remnick, the editor of the New Yorker. And I said, I want to write this piece on climate change in the Arctic. Um, and he said, and I listed all the compelling reasons why climate change was such an important issue, blah, blah, blah. And it was really David who said, you should write a series on that. You should write a three-part series on that. And uh, oh. I didn't really know what the three parts were going to be, but you can't really turn down that kind of an opportunity. So I, I did. I wrote a three-part series. And that's what became, that appeared in 2005. That took over a year to write. And sure. then, you know, as you know, once you sort of get on the climate change beat, it sort of takes over. So that's that's really what happened. So that is, once you've done that, you sort of became the go to person for climate change stories. And but you have but as you say, you hadn't. But let me go back then. I, I, I wanted to talk to about, uh, you know, sort of take a broad brush history. But you said you were kind of interested in science when you took that physics class but did you what about it w- earlier in your life what did were your parents uh any were they technical at all or or um my dad's a doctor my dad's an eye doctor uh, 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 so uh, uh. um you know i 
I would, um, so yeah, there was, you know, and when I was in high school, I would not have, you know, I took a lot of high school math, high school, you know, science, but, and I um, was fine, but what I <laughs> realized when I got to college is I really didn't have a very solid background. I didn't have a lot of, you know, talent. I didn't have a lot of, I, I was, I was fine at, you know, what you could memorize and but I didn't have a lot of physical intuition and that was a real problem. Now, now, did, but did you, did you read a lot of science? Did you read any science when you were a kid or no, or, or, uh, not, not wildly. I mean, I really read literature, you know, I novels. I really yeah. like to read novels and, you know, I not, when I look back on it and, you know, my own kids have now all gone through college and one was an English major, um, for better or worse, you know, reading novels is, you know, if there are any college students listening to this, I'm not sure reading novels is what you should do with your college education. I, I wish I had taken more science and even done, done badly in it. It, 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 it probably would have been better than a lot of classes I took more useful. Okay. Well, that's interesting to know, but I must say you've taken to it. Well, I mean, you're, you know, you, you, are not just a lovely writer and you are a lovely writer. I just, I enjoy reading you a lot, but but um, yeah, you're a great explainer of science issues. And I think it's, you know, I, I often, I, I like when it comes to real d deep science, I like to read things by, by scientists writing about science, yeah. because I, especially yeah. physics, because I yes. like to go to the or, <laughs> horse's mouth. And I think people do. But what is nice, though, is when someone doesn't have a background in science who writes, because they, um, a lot of scientists don't recognize exactly what it takes to explain, you know, what people want to hear or where they're coming from. And that's one of the hardest things you get to, you know, I've had a lot of experience and I, and, and I think I know that, but, but I'd say most, many of my colleagues, it's hard to recognize. And if you, and if you don't have a science background, um, uh, you know, my editors for my first bunch of books were not, all of which were science books were not scientists. And I found that particularly useful because when I wrote it, they could read this and say, well, what's that all about? And, and, and why, and why should I care? And so I think it's great in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I do think that not being a particularly, you know, talented scientist, I do bring a pretty average readers, you know, perspective to things. So I think that that is helpful, you know. Yeah, I'm, uh, it is that. And I think the two things that and I, they're characteristic of, of those books and, and writing in general, the two things that I, I guess I don't know whether I'd say admire most, but. I'm always so impressed by is your willingness to travel to all the places, which has got to be a lot of fun. I mean, let's, that's partly it, but, but I mean, to go in depth and to actually visit and see and explore in ways that, you know, I've gone to visit and see, and I say, gee whiz, you know, if I had been interested in ox, would I have found a boat to take me to that Island? And I, I'm always impressed that, you know, you, you well, those that. are the tricks of the trade. Lawrence. Yeah. 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 I guess so that, and also, uh, the background research, I'm very, you know, there's a lot of, uh, and some of the science, some of the history I'm very familiar with, some I'm not, but I'm really impressed by the, by the ancillary research. So those, those are, and that's great. And I think that's important. One of the things I want to, I want, before we got, by the way, in case listeners are wondering where we're going, uh, Betsy's last book, Under the White Sky is what I, is what I really want to get to because, uh, it's a it's a compelling discussion of current issues, and I want to go through that in some detail. But I want to preface it by going through some of the stuff from the Sixth Extinction, which you're pulled surprise winning book, because um, I think it leads n nicely into the next phase, which is the under the the white sky uh, in ways at least I found intellectually leads into them, and and so therefore I thought it'd be useful in a narrative sense. One of the things that 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 I hadn't appreciated so much that it's early in your book. But um, was this sudden shift, it seems so natural, as I think you say in the book, but it seems so natural for everyone, any one of us to realize things go extinct and things change in the earth. But, that, but to realize that that realization is fairly recent and very, and as intuitive as it seems now, it was equally non-intuitive early on. Look, you look out, it looked like the earth, nothing changed much over human time. And you quote, none other than Jefferson, which I, I would really blew me away, this quote from Jefferson, who you think of as the, you know, as the prototypical scientist politician in a way. And he, he said, um, he said, such is the economy of nature that no instance can be produced or have 
of her having permitted any one race of her animals to become extinct, of her having formed any link in her great work so weak as to be broken. What a definitive statement about the fact that things never change. And that, you know, and that's remarkable. An educated, intelligent man at that time um, to write that tells us that the whole, obviously the notion that, 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 that the things had become extinct was an essential part of realizing not just evolution, but realizing the impact, ultimately the impact, not just of changing conditions in nature, but human impacts on nature. I I wonder whether, you know, um, obviously I've, I've, I've said, talked about how, what an amazing impact on me it was. Did it equally surprise you? Um, You mean this notion that, that extinction was a relatively new concept? Yeah. Yeah, the history, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, everyone sort of knows the story of Darwin and the sort of, you know, birth, as it were, of the concept of, you know, evolution or descent with modification or whatever you want to call it. But the story of extinction um, is never, is very rarely told, you know, the discovery of extinction, which predates by a generation Darwin and was quite, I think, probably quite significant. He was obviously very familiar with what these debates. Um, and I think one of the reasons that that's the case is because the, the person who's really responsible for having, you know, promulgated, I guess, the notion of, of extinction and and really um, made that sort of common knowledge was it was a guy named Georges Cuvier, yeah. who was a French naturalist, a towering figure, you know, the Darwin, bef- before Darwin, the, by far the most famous naturalist in Europe um a generation or even really two generations before darwin and he he was a constant he's a very complicated figure he's not a darwin figure where you say oh you know just about everything they said turned out to be correct many things he said turned out to be incorrect um and he was involved in all sorts of complicated disputes and he was very much an enemy of lamarck um and lamarck had this sort of proto-evolutionary theory um and you know really tried to stomp that out and really was quite mean to Lamarck actually um and delivered quite a devastating eulogy of him anyway there's a lot of interesting history there um but it's not a neat story of scientific discovery it's it's a story of someone who had many brilliant insights and also many insights that you know were 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 not true but it but it's a good example of the fact that you know we tend uh, the public romanticizes scientists, certain scientists, and think of them as sort of individuals working alone late at night and having these aha moments. Um, and uh, uh, um, and that's just not the way science is done for the most part. And and Darwin just, Einstein wouldn't have been Einstein without Maxwell 50, 30, 50 years earlier. And, and Darwin wouldn't have been Darwin, I think, before maybe Cuvier. And also, as you point out, I guess it's, what's his name, Linnell, or what is his name? Lyle. Um, Lyle. Lyle. Charles yeah, Lyle, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. geologist. Um, and and I think that's really important to recognize, that the, is that you have to be at the right, you have to have the right talents, but you have to be lucky enough to be born at the right time, too. And I think that's uh, really uh, just the way science works. Yeah, no, there's a lot of interesting... Um, there's a lot of interesting history of science, you know, in that mo- time between, you know, the French Revolution and, um, you know, and Darwin, um, you know, as you know, just amazing strides made in many, many fields. And, uh, you know, once again, some some people who turned out to be, you know, completely right about one thing and completely wrong about yeah. another. Thing. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it. Yeah, I'm a big fan of history too, I guess. So that's probably why I, but but I think it's important to realize that, you know, I, I really think it's important to sort of overcome misconceptions people have about science. And that's certainly one. Science is a social activity. It, it's not socially constructed, but it's a social activity. And it depends crucially on that interaction and ideas moving around at the time. Now, I, I you know, I'm not going to do a, a whole review of the, of the sixth extinction, but the, the thing, because it anticipates ideas that come up in, in, in under the white sky. Um, the two biggest extinction, or at least the two extinctions that are perhaps most significant, which you talk about, you talk about a lot of extinctions, but the, in globally where life was almost wiped out in many ways are the Permian extinction and the Cretaceous extinction. The Cretaceous being the most famous one, the one where the dinosaurs 
um, wiped out by by um, an asteroid. And I, you know, you, you, well, lovely, you do a lovely history of that. And I uh, and, and I and I, I remember living through that time when Alvarez was, you know, you read about it, and you went poo pooed it. No, it's just it's just these dilettantes. These and now, you know, physicists assuming they have the answer for everything. And um, and then and then turning out to be right, and and it's amazing to watch that become part of front of culture, and we'll get and I think that anticipates something I want to come to at the end of our discussion. But the Permian is what people don't realize is a much bigger one, when when almost all with ninety percent of life, life it almost got wiped out, and it was it was not related to an asteroid. It was it was an it was a quote a natural event, and you and you. And you talk about it. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about it here because it anticipates, uh, you know, some of the concerns that may be related to the modern human era. Yeah. So you know, the end Permian extinction is sometimes called the mother of mass extinctions. It it mm. was a as you say a huge event. It came you know frighteningly close to wiping out multicellular life altogether. And um, no one. You know, I think that the really honest way to just des- to describe it would just say no one really knows exactly um, mm-hmm. what happened, but the sort of most popular theory has to do with this sort of volcanic province in um, Siberia. This you know many 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 year uh, eruption, not not of a volcano, but of a whole huge um, sort of as I say, it's not a normal volcano with one center. Um, I think it put enough lava to, I remember someone once saying to cover the United States to two or three feet. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah, huge. It's, 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 it's a huge lava. It's not even a field, whatever. Yeah. It's many, many, whatever, thousands of square miles. And um, then one theory is it sort of also burned through coal deposit it sent a lot of CO2 into the air, more CO2 than people can kind of figure out how exactly that happened. But the one thing that we do have are, you know, is evidence of carbon levels changing very mm. dramatically during, and people have tried to date it. It's happened 250 million years ago. It's hard to pin it down anywhere from 20,000 to 100,000 years, the span of time. And, um, we know that things got very warm. We know that the oceans got super warm and that they acidified. Um, so those are things that I think are pretty much agreed to. And then there's questions about whether other sort of toxic gases, you know, hydrogen sulfide were released that could have had really acute mm-hmm. uh, poisoning impacts, you know. But um, the thing that's, you know, obviously very scary is it was it was definitely an episode of global warming very serious global warming global heating um ocean acidification uh and you know paralleling in many ways what we're doing now people who have looked at this as carefully as you can have would say that the amount of co2 that was being emitted on an annual basis was less than we're now emitting it it, it went on for many thousands of years but on an annual basis it was less than what we're emitting so that's yeah. a frightening and fact. until the modern time probably the most dramatic injection of carbon dioxide at least that we know of in, in kind of history that we know of is so quickly Twenty thousand years may seem like a long time but in a geological sense it's quick and too quick in many cases for species to adapt um or in any way and and, and that's probably one of the reasons that that so many species died but but yeah now we are injecting more on a much quicker level and so you you know you can try and say that might be an experiment that we might be repeating but it's not an experiment we're, we're repeating a, a more dramatic experiment as we'll get to and i so i wanted to just so those two big things frame it but you talk about lots of separate extinctions some of which are due to hu- humans and some of which aren't but those aren't but the ones due to humans which is sort of the I mean, or to modern hominids, the extinction of the Neanderthals. I've got to mention the ox. Um, after the program's over, I want to. I want you to tell. I'm going again, as you know. I was just in Greenland and Iceland, but I'm going back again, and and I want to see the ox. And I might need your help. In, the ox at the Iceland Museum. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll need your okay. help with that. Yeah, he, um, I think he's, he, I'm not sure if he's, if he's out of storage or not, but I can yeah. put you in touch with the right people. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And 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 mammals sort of individual episodes of extinctions of related to hominids and then of course more dramatically the carbon dioxide issue 
and you focus a lot, not just on, you know, the issue that a lot of people do, which is global warming, but the, in that book, the, the, the acidification of the oceans and the claim that, you know, the oceans have a, had a pH of 8.2, then was down to 8.1. If it goes to 7.8, you quote in the book, a number of people saying that's a turning point from which, yeah, and that 7.8, when people are talking about the Permian, the, the ocean became very acidic and most, many species could survive. And, and the suggestion is that 7.8, is about the level where, where, uh, um, where things sort of turn around, right? Yeah, that that is a big concern, you know, and and you know, this is at the sur- these are the surface waters, but the surface waters are where a lot a lot of things live. Um, so yeah, there's a real fear that things like coral reefs um, can't survive a pH drop, um, you know. Mm-hmm very much beyond what we already have. Now, the sad thing, the really sad thing is that, you know, some people would point out, well, it's, you know, unclear we're going to get to the point of running that experiment because coral reefs are already being so devastated by global warming, you know. Yeah, although although we'll talk about that. I mean, there's some opt- there's some good news in, in the last little while since I think your book was written. I'm going to take a quick one-minute break. My little dog, who's old, 15 <laughs> years old, is came out from under sleeping here. She just fell the other day. And I'm going to take care of her downstairs so she can go down for dinner. I, I, I thought she'd sleep through this. She usually does. But I'll be right okay. back. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Sure. And, and uh, yeah, as I say, usually she's pretty good about sleeping through that. But um, yeah, that so that 7.8 uh, is a number we'll, we maybe come back to. But but uh, yeah, as you said, we don't know whether we'll get there. We're, it's it's a long ways around. But but it's important to realize that, that I you know, if in case people didn't realize that that global warming is just which sort of the word is has occupied people but but um but oceans 2.0 is another significant argument and someone i think someone had said that i i can't remember which book now it was in that um that if it got down to that point the oceans would look like they did in the pre-cambrian era um where basically before the yeah it would be yeah. There's a guy, an Australian guy, uh, who wrote a piece, and yeah, it would be slimy. He said, "Yeah, no, we're you know." I mean, I think one of the, I, I definitely think one of the points of that of the sixth extinction, or one of the things I learned in the process of, of of writing it, and that I hope comes through in the book, is you know the pressures that we are putting on the non-human world. You know, climate change is just one of them. And right now, I would say it's not even probably the most serious one. The most serious one is simply we're taking the resources that other species need. You know, where are you going to yeah. live if you used to live in the rainforest and the rainforest has been converted into a soy field? You know, yeah. um, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that a lot of those species are not going to make it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, I think... Um... Uh, that certainly comes through. Uh, in, 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 you know, it's it's an interesting book because it's it's not just a direct gloom and doom book. It's sort of a, this is the end book, but it's it um, it talks about this in a broader context. And one of the things that that will come again in the new book, and and I wanted to ask you about this uh, because I, I I remember I almost ran the first time you came to when I was at at ASU when I had you come speak. We were. I think talking about running a meeting on the on the Anthropocene, which at that time seemed like a new word. Um, shortly after I got there, and and I guess um, uh, the 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 chemist Crutzen was a Nobel Prize winning chemist had had first suggested the Anthropocene as a new geological era. It, take us through that for a, a little bit, if you wouldn't mind. So the word um, it's a little bit unclear who came up with it, but it was definitely, as you say, popularized by Paul Paul Crutzen, who was um, one of the guys who won a Nobel in 95 for having discovered um, ozone depleting chemicals and really saving the world from, um, you know, really, really serious consequences. Um, I mean, there are serious consequences, but worse consequences um, by, you know, eliminating or phasing out chlorofluorocarbons. Um, And he, uh, he came up with this idea or he popularized the idea has that that we were living in a new geological epoch the anthropocene and he proposed this in 2004 in a very short one page thing in nature called i think it was called the geology of mankind or something like that very short but 
quite forceful little essay, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where he just ran through the ways in which humans are becoming, I mean, I think he put it, you know, a force that rivals what we would consider the great forces of nature, volcanism, you know, mm -hmm. erosion, the forces that have um, defined geological epochs of the past. And uh, it, it sort of just took off. I mean, it really just took off because it was a word that encapsulated, in, in, you know, it's one word to describe something that's an immensely complicated phenomenon. Yeah, now he, uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, following it, which you describe in that book, and and people talked about, you know, the Anthropocene being basically the point, the, the era where humans globally changed the characteristics of the Earth in in some ways that could or should be defined. But talk about it, it going. Some people are saying going back a few million years, namely the rise, the early rise of hominids itself, um, as being the beginning of the Anthropocene, and. Nowadays, well, I'm not what... sure that anyone. I do have to say, Lawrence, I'm not sure anyone would say that it goes back a few million years. I think there's this early Anthropocene, you know, sort of hypothesis that it dates back to the origins of agriculture. That yeah. that's when we really started to do what you know, very broad scale um, burning a forest, cutting down a mm -hmm. forest, and we changed the world on a geological scale at that moment. That's okay, it's, I thought somewhere in the book you said that 2.6 million. I thought, wow, I'd never heard that before. But maybe there was some discussion early on of, 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 of dating it back to the point of modern of hominids. But yeah, no, certainly the point of it's more, you know, when humans have dramatically been changing the environment other than causing the extinction of other hominid species when Homo sapiens have been, certainly the rise of agriculture, which I'll talk about in a second. But, but uh, the reason I wanted to bring it up, you, you went at that point in the book, it's just 2000 and... 14 or 2000, I forget when it was, uh, that 2014, yeah. Um, yeah. you say, and there's going to be a discussion of what's the definition of the Anthropocene, which is actually what the topic that that we were going to have my my, my scientific meeting on uh, at the Origins Project when I when I was in charge of that. And um, uh, and you say what what's going to, it'll be, to, we'll wait and see if in 2016 there's supposed to be a discussion. Nowadays, I've always been, it seemed to me, more familiar with the notion of the Anthropocene as effectively beginning with the rise of nuclear weapons when humans had a, produced a long-term impact by you know radioactive isotopes in the atmosphere. So I wanted to ask what what happened in 2016 um, after your book was written. Did, was that yeah was, yeah it did not it, it, it that world conference of you know they have this like stratigraphy mm -hmm. um, I think it's quadrennial and. Um, they did not formally recognize. In fact, I need if I do another edition of the book, I need to change that. Um, so they did not formally recognize the Anthropocene. Stratigraphers are extremely conservative, and one, yeah. you know, naming a new geological epoch is not something they do lightly. Um, <laughs> yeah. But one of the points that people would make is, well, look, you ain't seen nothing yet. You know, yeah. if humans were just at the very beginning of this epoch uh, wait another you know thousand years and then you're really then you can name it um so while it is um informally extremely widespread and it's all over the scientific literature it is not you know if you if you still look at the geological official geological time clock we are still in the holocene uh officially which is you know the period since the end of the last ice age yeah yeah as i say the what i've heard among my colleagues anyway is being the clear example was radio, which is really recent, obviously, there's the explosions well, of the atomic bomb. But. What happened was that people, and these guys are stratigraphers, and they really went out and they and they were trying to find what's called the, this, this globally synchronous, like how would you define the beginning of the Anthropocene yeah. so that geologists a million years from now, from now could see it. And one of the things, the best signal that they came up with that was synchronous all around the world was radioactive isotope yeah, that's right in fact some people have argued uh, in, in in a different context i i have written and 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 talked to people when as we look for the uh, life elsewhere in the universe for signals in atmospheres one with with the new jwst telescope will be looking for you know oxygen and methane and other things but some people have suggested that another signature for an advanced civilization is radioactive isotopes in the atmosphere that's, that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, yeah I think it is. Um, um, okay. 
I want to get to the new book, but the end of I, I think presaged, as I say, by some remarks at the end of the at the end of your new book, which so I want to read them if you don't mind, then ask you to comment on. Them. But you say, uh, and I'm picking you, one pause. So in an extinction in an extinction event of our own making, what ha what happens to us? One possibility, the possibility implied by the Hall of Biodiversity, which you talk about in that chapter, is that we too will eventually be undone by our transformation of the ecological landscape. And then I'll skip down. Among the many lessons that emerge from the geological record, and perhaps the most sobering, is that in life, as in mutual funds, past performance is no guarantee of future results. When a mass extinction occurs, it takes out the weak and also lays low the strong. And um, then you say, then there's another paragraph, another possibility considered by some to be more upbeat is that human ingenuity will outrun any disaster human ingenuity sets in motion. I found this particularly prescient given the next book you're gonna have, which we'll, mm -hmm. you'll talk about. There are serious scientists who argue, for instance, that should global warming become too grave a threat, we can counteract it by re-engineering the atmosphere, blah, blah, blah. So the, the idea that that human ingenuity will, will, will outrun any disasters that human ingenuity sets in motion as the other option, which really in some sense could be quoted as an, at, at, in the epilogue of your, of, the, of your new book. But anyway, um, then you say, obviously the fate of our own species concerns us disproportionately, but at the risk of sounding anti-human, some of my best friends are human, I will say that it is not in the end what's most worth attending to. Right now in the amazing moment that to us counts as the present, we are deciding without quite meaning to which evolutionary pathways remain open and which will forever be closed. No other creature has ever managed this, and it will unfortunately be our most enduring legacy. And I might as well read the last sentence too. The sixth extinction will continue to determine the course of life long after everything people have written and painted and built has been ground into dust and giant rats have or have not inherited the earth. So you talk about us being destroyed and then you talk about whether, whether human ingenuity will, will, will address it. Two important questions. You you don't come out on either side. <laughs> what you come out on is, is is the amazing present, and I wanted you to comment on that a little bit because I, uh, uh, I I'm going to ask you near the end of this interview a question that came from my brother-in-law, who's a huge fan of yours, and I asked him if he wanted to ask you a question. So I'll let I'll ask his question near the end. But what do you think? What what about that sort of the the pessimistic, the optimistic, or the or the thrill of the present? Well, I. You know, there's a quote from Jonathan Shell's very famous, yeah. you know, book, essay, the State called. of the Earth, you know, yeah. um, future, I think it's something like futurism has never been a respectable profession. I mean, making, um, you know, I, I don't consider, I don't have any greater um, access to the future than anybody else. Um, and my predictions are, you know, very often wrong. So I don't, I don't put much stock in them. Um, I think that what is, what I really want to impress upon people right now is that what we consider to be ordinary, you know, ordinary life is extraordinary in the history of life on earth. And that should be very, very sobering to us, right? I mean, digging fossil fuels out of the ground, you know, burning through them that seems just really ordinary you go to mm -hmm. you know mobile station you fill up your car you drive around what could be more ordinary than that but it is really extraordinary and it is changing the atmosphere it's changing the chemistry of the oceans as we discussed before at a rate that is probably unprecedented perhaps with the exception of the you know asteroid impact uh in human in in the history of life on earth and you know what are the odds that that's going to end well? Well, they don't seem that great, you know, to be honest. They just don't seem that great. And they're certainly not ending well for a lot, a lot of other species. And then, you know, that does get to the question of, you know, what do we care about and how much of the natural world, how many other species can we lose, you know, and just merrily glide along ourselves? And those are questions I can't answer. Yeah, no, but you raise, and I think that's really important. And I, and 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 in some sense, as I said, I think the new book addresses that very issue. And again, if I already said, you know, there's one paragraph, one sentence that presages the new book, which is uh, 
technology, solving the problems of technology. Another is two pages earlier, you talk about um, this crow's sex life at Kenohi's tragic comic sex life provides more evidence, if any more was needed, of how seriously humans take extinction. Such is the pain of the loss of a single species caused, such is the pain of the loss of a single species causes that we're willing to perform ultrasounds on rhinoceroses and hand jobs on crows. Certainly the commitment of people like Terry, you quote two people, Terry Roth and Barbara Durant, and institutions like the Cincinnati and the San Diego Zoo could be invoked as a reason for optimism. And if this were a different kind of book, I would, you point that out. Which now takes us to the new book, which is, in case anyone, <laughs> I don't want to give the misconception, in case if anyone thinks of it as an optimistic book, it isn't. <laughs> but it does address this question. It's a lighthearted, a lighthearted take on yeah, yeah, calamity, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's a, it is a light, in some sense lighthearted, and it's not a bloom and gloom. But it's a sober, it, it constantly asks the question almost at the end of every chapter. The book is about, and, and, and I think you described it at the end, but I would say how technology can be employed to try and fix the problems that technology has produced in some sense with varying results, very varying results, and, um, and, and often bad ones. But to point out um, the good ones, I, 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 which I, you know, aren't sometimes stressed. There's one now, and then I want to at the end talk about one that isn't in the book that I wanted to ask you about. But, but, but the the ozone layer, which we discussed earlier, is a great example of humans uh, devising technology to solve the problems that technology created and doing it very successfully. Really, you would say that? I mean, what solved the ozone solved, and it's not solved. Yeah. Um, was stopping doing something. Yeah, no, right. I was thinking about that, and then I decided, no, I don't agree with that. It was stopping okay, doing sure. something, but it was also developing alternative ways, alternative technologies that could do the same thing, allowing yes. you to stop. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to stop. So I think there's more than just that. I think if, you know, getting rid of Freon, getting rid of the those uh, fluorocarbons uh, would have would have been necessary, but we were able to, at the same time, develop technologies that allowed us to make that um, that transition easily or relatively easily. Yes. You agree? I, I don't, I don't just, dis, I don't disagree with that. I mean, you know, along with the sort of whole, you know, Rube Goldberg approach to everything yeah. that we take, you know, some of those alternatives have proved to be immensely powerful greenhouse gases. And now we're having to phase those out. So we don't, you know, the idea that we get something for nothing, it's pretty rare. Yeah, it's, it's not nothing, very lucky but... when you get it. Yeah, well, you're lucky when you get it. But ozone, I think, so far is a success story, at least. But um, well, at least it's it's got it's staved off one huge problem. And you're right. The question is, will it produce others? But but um, but you know, the, I want to present some optimism. I mean, we humans are ingenious, and and sometimes we're too ingenious for our own good, which is what a lot of the discussion in the book about is. So I want to go through the book now for the next you know hour or so um, uh, in more detail. Um, and because you give a bunch of there's there's three se sections and you give a bunch of interesting examples that give different perspectives of the same problem. The first has to do with Chicago. Uh, I mean, I was blown away by that. I must admit by that. But and the for going from Chicago to Carp, that long, that not necessarily long, but um, but that long and winding road. Talk about what the problem. How, I mean, what Chicago got to do with any of this and. And, and and why don't you uh, bring us in there? Well, so Chicago was, um, you know, built along the Chicago River, um, which drained into Lake Michigan. It was really, the Chicago River was a very puny little river with not much of a flow to it because it's so flat in that part of the country. But it was really crucially important to why Chicago is there. It was how they got rid of their waste. Um, and as the stockyards grew in the late mid to late 19th century it became you know just um an untenable situation of just all this filth in the water it was the stench was terrible the um you know water barely flowed uh it was you know just generally revolting and there was also a lot of increasingly concern as people sort of under started to understand the germ theory of disease about waterborne diseases, you know, typhoid, cholera, and there and there were, you know, there were outbreaks in Chicago. So it was it was resolved at the end of the 
19th century, people realized you could not keep dumping your sewage into your water source. The, the sewage was going to Lake Michigan. Chicago gets its drinking water from Lake Michigan. It still gets its drinking water from Lake Michigan. You couldn't do this anymore. So what were you going to do? Well, the answer that they came up with, which was quite ingenious, was they were going to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. And that is what they did in this huge um, engineering problem at the very, very project at the very end of the 20th century. They were reverse the flow of the Chicago River by digging this canal that connected the river, putting a lock on the lake side of the river, what used to be the mouth, putting a lock there, and then um, directing the river into this canal that then flowed basically into the Illinois River and then from there into the into the Mississippi. And now, so now the Chicago River is is flows into the Gulf, ultimately into the Gulf of Mexico. And that was a solution to one problem, what to do about Chicago's drinking water. And it has introduced a new set of problems. And that's really what that chapter of the book is about. And the new set of problems are invasive species, basically, um, in particular, right? Yes. Yeah, so what happened was um, those were two watersheds. There was the Great Lakes watershed and there was the Mississippi watershed. And they were not connected. They were very close. Um, but they were not connected. So uh, it was, you know, virtually impossible for an aquatic creature to get from one to the other. So that, you know, was useful. But then what we did, in addition to connecting those two waterways so that anything could pass between them, um, what really messed things up was um, doing things like building the St. Lawrence Seaway into the Great Lakes, brought in a huge number of invasive species. And then what the chapter is really about is an is an invasive that was introduced into the Mississippi system in the 60s. And I'm happy to tell that story. It's kind of a crazy story. Yeah, yeah um, it's a crazy story. I want to yeah, know that the Asian carp, which is actually not one species, it's four species, but they've all been tremendously successful. They've just taken over the Mississippi and they really want to keep them out of the Great Lakes. So that has led to this new round of interventions. Um, which I go visit in that chapter, this electric barrier that they've put up. Yeah, where I was they, amazed to discover. Uh, Why don't you tell yeah. me? I mean, I just couldn't believe that anyone would come up with such a thing. Why don't you tell yeah. me? Yeah, yeah. They, they pulse a lot of current, a lot of voltage into this canal that they built. And um, enough so that I was told you could potentially kill yourself if you jumped in the water. Um, and the idea is it is the fish is moving up stream or what's now upstream um mm. it will uh get a shock and turn around that's the theory um but no one has you know a lot of faith in this and they keep finding fish beyond the fish barrier they just found one recently um and there's a new barrier and and they're going to spend almost a billion dollars and the army corps of engineers is, has just sort of announced plans they're, they're they got a big appropriation they're going to start it so they're going to put in a new barrier further south that's going to have bubbles and sound and also electricity to try to keep these fish from getting into the great lakes which may honestly already be too late for that no one really knows yeah and and and, and if they get in the great lakes their discussion i didn't know about i mean these jumping the silver carp is it the, the yeah is it? Yeah. that's that's uh i there's a after I, I when i read that chapter i went online and looked at several videos of people taking boats through the through rivers and and having and being constantly barraged by fish jumping into their faces it's really yeah quite no they're really it's it's really um you know it's scary when you're there and and they i mean i talked to a lot of people i got i got hit by one they're 80 pound fish you know there's yeah. not a little fish and they jump into the boat and they whack you. And I talk to people who'd had to have reconstructive, you know, surgery on their face because of this. So it's it's really a, you know, that is less of an ecological problem than a, you know, recreation problem. No one, no one really wants them around. And so, so that's an interesting. I mean, it's an interesting introduction to the unintended side effects of, of of technological solutions to a technological problem. In this case, our our garbage problem. But and then and then but I love the at the end the 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 um, 
the potential solution to, the, to these invasive species is to eat them. And and you know, and and so I've got to, I want to read the last part of this the chapter because I found it funny. So you talk about the guy Carter who owns a fish market in Springfield, is like Irons, another person, a carp eating evangelist. He told me that one of his friends had his nose broken by a jumping carp, and as a result has had to have eye surgery. We need to control them, he said. If you can catch millions and tens of millions of pounds of them, it's going to help. And the only way to do that is to create a demand for them. He took the strips he'd cut, rolled them into breadcrumbs, and deep fried them. It was a warm late summer day, and by this point he was sweating profusely. When the strips were done, he offered them around as samples to general approval. And I'm going to jump ahead. Um, uh, it was hard to know how many miles Parola's silverfin had traveled in their journey from fingerlings to finger food, but I figured it had to be at least 20,000. And that wasn't counting the trip their ancestors had made to get to the United States in the first place. Did this really represent the Asian carp solution? I had my doubts. Still, when the cakes came my way, I took two of them. They were indeed quite tasty. <laughs> and so, you know, the, so what do you think? You think there's, I mean, it seems, it, you, one, reading this, it, it, I mean, obviously there's, there's a, a, you know, your tongue is in your cheek here, but, but um, it, it, it doesn't seem, um, would, one should not be optimistic that that's going to be a solution to saving the problem, especially in the Great Lakes, right? Well, it's funny that you mentioned this. I wish I, I gave the shirts to one of my kids because because they were a little bit too big for me. But I just got in the mail from the Illinois Department of Natural Resources um, a T-shirt, two T-shirts that say, um, they have a symbol, as they say, Kopi on it. And it says, like, eat healthy, do good, or something like that. I can't remember the exact, um, but you can look it up, Kopi, C-O-P-I. And you can look uh -huh. it up. Um, there's this new marketing campaign in by that Illinois paid for and yeah. is is promoting to rename Asian carp. People didn't like the name carp for some reason. Uh -huh. Carp doesn't have a good reputation in this country, um, and so they are calling them copy for copious, and they uh -huh. are really trying to get people to eat them. And they, I mean. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's a solution in the sense that I think everyone would realize and, and, and they would acknowledge you're never getting rid of these fish. They're just too, too many of them. Um, but, you know, once humans go after something, you know, we're really, really good at diminishing its numbers. So, and, and you know, it's a very wasteful society that can, what, what they do now, these fish are, so common i mean i've been out fishing for them with these guys they pay people they're people who basically make their entire living um they go out they net these fish hundreds and hundreds of them at a time no problem whatsoever and then they just dump them in a semi they get ground up into fertilizer which you know isn't a bad you know native americans use you know fish in a mm. in the hole or whatever mm -hmm. as fertilizer and it's very very good fertilizer but it is um, not the most efficient use of animal protein. So, you know, a society that can do that is a very wasteful society. And mm. if you could get people to eat these fish, which, as I say, are very tasty. And, you know, Asia carp in China is considered a real celebratory meal, a whole carp. So and it's delicious. So we should be eating more carp. We shouldn't be, you know, grinding it up into fertilizer. OK, well, that's so much for the carp. The next thing you discuss is New Orleans, which um, which is a problem in its own right. I mean, and you raise the question: Should New Orleans even even be there? But why don't you um, well, why don't you talk about the problem, and then and then and then we'll talk a little bit about the solution. I turn it over to you. Yeah. So you know, this is another case. I mean, all of these situations, as you as you talk about, they're really about whether technology or or engineering. You know, can you can you engineer your way out of an engineered problem? Can you technologize your way out of a problem caused by technology? And in the case of New Orleans, the problem is that we've engineered New Orleans not to flood. We've engineered the whole Mississippi River not to flood. And the Mississippi Delta was built by the Mississippi River flooding. So now you have arrested a process that has been going on really since time immemorial that built all of Southern Louisiana and now you're saying that's going to stop, but you didn't think forward enough to think, okay, when that stops, when you're not building land, you're losing land. And Louisiana 
uh, it's a crisis. It's called the land loss crisis. You're just, you know, the coast is is, is drifting north. Absolutely. There's just no doubt about that. And um, New Orleans is, you know, a lot of the Western Louisiana um, is pretty thinly populated. It's very swampy. Um, you know, it gets terribly damaged. The Lake Charles area just, you know, had terrible hurricanes mm-hmm. recently and may never recover. But New Orleans is a great American city. And we're very hesitant to just say, give up on New Orleans. Um, but it's one of the fastest places, fastest sinking places on earth. A lot of it's below sea level. It's in this bowl that you constantly have to pump out the water. When it rains, even, you have to pump the water up over these huge flood walls and flood defenses. And as you pump, you are contributing to subsidence. So it's a terrible, vicious cycle. And no one has a very, uh, has an answer to it. But the latest idea is to try to sort of create fake flooding, uh, controlled flooding to counter flood Mm -hmm. control. So we'll punch a hole in the levee south of New Orleans. And when the river's running high, it's carrying a lot of sediment, we'll let that sediment out through these gates. And that hopefully will build land in some of these very marshy areas. And that hopefully, once again, there's a lot of hopefullys here, will protect, help protect Louisiana from storms, surges coming from the south. Okay, uh, now, okay, that's a great summary of a, of a complicated issue. By the way, I went to ask you, New Orleans is subsiding. You say it's one of the fastest places. I wonder, um, uh, there are a lot of places around the world that that's a, a big problem. Besides sea level rise, it's subsiding. When I was in Vietnam, I uh, learned that a lot of the country down there. But more, when I was in Mexico City recently, you can see it. You can see this. Uh, it was built on a, I mean, a lake, an uh, underground lake, yeah. and that's what's been used for for water for people. And you can see yeah. the whole streets. And I'm, I was told it was sinking sometimes more than a few centimeters a year. I don't, is New Orleans more or less than Mexico City, do you know? You know, know that New Orleans is up there, Jakarta yeah. also sinking. Usually it's these delta places, but you know, as you are alluding, you know, when you're sucking up a lot of groundwater um, and your delta or, and you have soils, as you say, that are a lake bed that are um, vulnerable to compaction, then you're going to get subsidence. So you, it, it is a, fairly widespread problem. And and as I say, especially in Delta, in the Netherlands, right, where they've, mm. you know, diked up everything and where, you know, the Rhine is completely contained now. And that's that's completely a river Delta, that whole area, the low countries. And so um, they have the same, they have exactly the same problem. Now, you you, talk, you present the problem and you, you describe in the book, I want to read this. You talk about the structures that have been, you know, these huge dikes and other things. You say these Pharaoh, pharaonic structures is that maybe that's, that's a new word for me I, I think it's like pharaohs right i don't know is it pharaonic yeah. structures have kept the city dry through several recent storms and from a certain perspective new orleans now appears substantially better protected than when katrina hit but what looks like a defense from one angle can look like a trap from another quote you must have a replenished coast jeff hebert a former deputy mayor of new orleans told me because as goes the coast so goes new orleans since the close of the crevasse period, uh, land lost to the south has brought the city some 20 miles closer to the Gulf. It's been estimated that for every three miles a storm has to travel over land, its surge is reduced by a foot. If this is the case, then the threat to New Orleans has grown seven feet higher. Drive out nature, though you will, with a pitchfork, Horace wrote in 20 BC. Yet she will always hurry back, and before you know it, it will break through your perverse disdain in triumph. I was actually surprised you didn't use uh, that quote from Horace at the beginning of the, in some sense of the epigraph, <laughs> beginning of the, uh, I mean, 20 BC. I mean, it really captures the whole issue, doesn't it? Yeah. Yes, it does. it does. Now, at some point you, um, you, uh, um, you basically say uh, again at the, I think uh, I think to end this chapter, uh, and I like the I like your paragraphs at the end of each chapter, which often pr- give a slightly different perspective. And so you're talking about uh, the famous uh, McPhee, the writer about about nature. He said um, uh, uh, McPhee included Acha Fayala in his book The Control of Nature, published in 1989. Since then, 
A lot has happened to complicate the meaning of control, not to mention nature. The Louisiana Delta is now often referred to by hydrologists as a coupled human and natural system, or for short, CHANS. It's an ugly term, another nomenclature hairball, but there's no simple way to talk about the tangle we've created. A Mississippi that has been harnessed, straightened, regularized, and shackled can still exert a godlike force. It is no longer exactly a river, though. It's hard to say who occupies Mount Olympus these days, if anyone. Well, so I, I want to ask you, that sounds, well, it, it's question, it, it, it sounds uh, less than optimistic, let me put it that way. Um, when I look at, when I looked, read this chapter, I don't see any solution. Do you, do you, do you see any long-term solution here? Or, or do you think we just have to, eventually are going to have to give up? On New Orleans? Yeah. Um, I think it's, I think it's very, you know, it depends what time frame you're talking about. I mean, I suppose, you know, the famous, uh, I guess, Keynesian mm-hmm. quote from John Maynard Keynes, in the long run, we're all dead. I mean, in the long run, all cities will be, um, you know, yeah um, you know troy or whatever but yeah. um but new orleans has probably uh a shorter lifespan than most cities i mean all all low lying coastal cities are 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 vulnerable and are going to be you know undergoing massive uh, efforts to protect themselves and in in some cities like new orleans where you add subsidence to the mix and not having any bedrock underneath you um you get um an an extra set of problems that is very hard to see how you get uh around that and another city i should add which i don't talk about in the book but which i've written about fairly extensively is miami which is built on um you know old limestone very porous very hard to keep you know someone said to me, the piece I wrote about Miami, the water comes at us from six directions. You know, you're getting water from um, from everywhere, and one of the places you get water is from below. So if you just increase the sort of pressure on, um, you know, of the of the sea, the sea the seas rise and the pressure uh, grows. Um, you, you know, you just get water bubbling up, and this lens of fresh water also that Florida depends on for its drinking water also gets, you know, your saltwater intrusion. So there's a lot, tons of problems also facing um, that kind of geology. Well, yeah, and in fact, and one of the things I don't want to stress, which isn't stressed so much because you focus on it, it's the problem, but these cities like New Orleans and Miami benefit from being part of a rich country that can build massive dikes or who, who knows what, and maybe be necessary for New York City as well. But, but the same problems, exactly the same problems, are facing huge, populous third world countries. Uh, like uh, you know, as a, what the reason I wrote my last book on climate change is a visit to to the, the to the uh, um, Delta in in in, in um, South Vietnam, um, and that whole country is below sea level and sinking. And you know, Vietnam may have the resources, but Bangladesh probably doesn't. But all these countries, and it's similar things. It's sea level rise compounded by most of these countries are, are also subsiding because they have huge populations. And, and there are many countries in the world where, where adaptation will not be possible. The same problems exist, but there's no clear solution. Whereas there may, you, know, you can imagine technological short-term fixes, at least to American, these American cities. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, a, a different book and a very important book and, you know, many books have been written getting at different aspects of this problem are would absolutely be looking at, um, you know, that side of, of of the problem. And there's just a book I have um, by a, a British a journalist whom I admire, Gay of Vince. It's called um, nomad century it's it's about you know how many refugees are going to be on the move yeah. sure from climate places. refugees yeah so yeah. i think that is a huge um you know yes as you say th- there's one question can you solve you know these engineering problems with engineering if you have the money to do it and then what do you do if you don't have the money to do it? yeah and and then the other you just hit one i wasn't going to go up but the other 
The other unanticipated consequence is often geopolitical consequences, and the climate refugees are a big one. I tried to get Australia to be, in the time of a former conservative government, what they called the liberals there, um, <laughs> uh, uh, when I was on TV, you know, talking about the fact they were, at that time, they were, there were boat people, and they were shipping them off to, as you know, to this awful place, off, yeah, they didn't want to let yeah. them into Australia. I yeah, said, well, that's yeah, a few thousand, yeah. but, you know, look at the countries near you, and who's the... When, when you have 100 million climate refugees, where are they going to, where's close to place to go? If you're worried about it now, you might want to consider it later. But for some reason, that kind of long term forward thinking of the future just doesn't seem to work. Um, well, really you know, as many people have pointed out, one of the you know reasons that we're in the rather disastrous situation or, or potentially disastrous situation that we're in is that both our economic, you know, year end profits and our electoral cycles are not um do not encourage long-term thinking we're just not um very good at it and it is interesting to think about you know because definitely we are all beneficiaries you know i mean as you mentioned i grew up in new york the new york city water system which took you know basically a century to build but people had a lot of foresight and bought up that land um for the watershed shed and you know had they not done that I, I don't know what you we'd be, you know what people would be mm. drinking in New York, but we we seem to have increasing trouble. The, the better we see into the future, mm. the harder time we have of doing anything. And it's 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 kind of an interesting question as to why, as a society, we're so you know paralyzed, even as the world is changing really you know rapidly around us. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a yeah. Okay, but now let's talk about. Well, I'm not sure. I, it's an optimistic story, but. It harkens back to that that st- sentence you had about talking about praising those people, about how sensitive we are to certain extinctions and how people are working really hard. And you might and and those people are, you admire so much that that um, um, uh, that uh, um, y- you know it's it's surprising to see. And that the the example is the Devil's Hole pupfish, which I I found an interesting side story. Of course, obviously, I'd never heard of the Devil's Hole pupfish. Um, but boy, it's a lot of work trying to trying to save that little little bugger. Why don't you why don't you why don't you talk about that for a second? Sure. So the devil's hole um, pupfish is a it's been called the rarest fish in the world. It probably is. It's it it's only um, hab, habitat is this one um, freshwater pool in the middle of the Mojave, which is actually part of this really interesting huge underground aquifer and it's, it's sort of one moment yeah. where the aquifer hits the surface a very small little surface but it's very very deep um and it's, it's heated it's geothermally heated it's over 90 degrees the water um terrible conditions for fish you know low yeah. oxygen most fish couldn't survive but this one little fish which is sort of the apex predator in this ecosystem um is somehow there no one knows how and and has been there but in the 60s and 70s people withdrew water started withdrawing water from the aquifer to grow you know alfalfa and i mean just things that should not be done honestly in the mojave um and the water level dropped and the fish uh really suffered and so um what happened is um really it, it was all, not just um the best um you know, intentions of humans, to be to be honest, it was the Endangered Species Act kicked in. And they were one of the first listed species. And when you're uh-huh. uh, on the Endangered Species Act, there has to be a recovery plan. That's like the law. And um, since these fish only have one habitat in the whole world, uh, well, one of the things was to try to restore that habitat. Very difficult. You can't restore that aquifer, which is so hum- humongous. You can't just raise the water level. Mm-hmm. Um so what they ended up doing as the fish continued to decline, despite a lot of, a lot of effort, was they built them a fake habitat and a totally enclosed indoor pool to try to replicate. It was impossible to replicate because this thing's, you know, 500 feet deep at least. Um, but as best they could, that section of the water, they mostly live in like the top 75 feet of the water. Uh, and I visited it, and the labor that goes into trying to keep those fish alive is uh, is astonishing. It's astonishing to read. I mean, you read about them recreating every you know exact replica of the shelf where they tend to breed, 
and I mean, everything is, it's, it's amazing and shocking to me. It was shocking to me that people spent the time and that anyone had the money to spend to on that. And it's, it's heartening in some sense, but one also has to ask, and this is a big question that people ask when they say, oh, you know, what about saving this frog or this, or this, uh, or this pupfish? You know, is that expenditure of time and effort, while as loving and wonderful and admirable, is it worth it? Well, I mean, I think, you know, I quote this guy in the book, and it's it's really one of my favorite quotes in the in the book. And he he's a guy who's who saved another species of pupfish. These fish tend to have very, you know, can have very tiny ranges. So he mm-hmm. saved another species by literally, you know, it's pool was drying out he took them out in a bucket yeah um and he's now um in his 90s but still quite quite with it and people always asked him what you know they would say what good are pupfish and he said well what good are you you know and the idea that um you know what good are these fish doing us you know on some level you know none we don't we don't eat them if we ate them you know they're 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 you know I think I say something like, oh, their combined weight would be like that of a, you know, fish burger or something. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. you know, you're saying, why do we spend all this money? Why do we spend all this money? Why, why, why do we, you know, we spend it on crypto? We spend it on, mm-hmm. you know, That's terrible, right. terrible things. So I, I would say, why shouldn't we spend it on this? I mean, if you if you told me, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, there's only X number of amount of money to spend uh, on trying to restore ecosystems or save species and we have to choose between x and y and there's a certain amount of triage you know that's true and that's happening all the time we are triaging without consciously or without Mm -hmm. calling it that but you know this is several million dollars to build this facility Mm -hmm. four million dollars or whatever we spend four million dollars on you know a bomb so i don't have trouble um (laughs) yeah exactly I, i don't have any trouble saying uh we should be doing this yeah, no, I mean, I didn't want to suggest it wasn't. I wanted to ask the question, <laughs> is it worth it? And I wanted to hear an answer. That, and that, But I, I want to read the last paragraph of that chapter because, again, it's lovely literature. That night in my last, my last in Nevada, I stayed on the Strip at the Paris in a room with a view of the Eiffel Tower. I know that well. This being Vegas, the tower rose out of a swimming pool. The water was the blue of antifreeze. From somewhere near the pool, a sound system pumped out a beat that reached me dull and throbbing through the sealed windows of the seventh floor. I really wanted a drink, but I couldn't bring myself to go da- back down to the lobby past the concierge, the toilette, and la reception to find a faux French bar. I thought of the devil's hole pupfish in their simulated cavern. I wondered, is this how they felt in their darker moments? <laughs> I love that. Okay, next. The Super Coral Project um, and assisted evolution. It's a really interesting idea. And I know it's actually worked in a variety of areas of engineering, uh, uh, assisted evolution uh, uh, podcast. I'll do sometime in the future with a Nobel Prize winning chemist on that. But but when you talk about about this project, I mean, the, as you talk about in the last book, corals are, you can't help but not, it's impossible not to know that corals are in trouble. You often read, Results saying that the 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 um, Great Barrier Reef is dead. It isn't, but and 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 one has to be wary of overstating these things sometimes. But why don't you talk about the problem and this interesting solution? Because I think it's fascinating. So the the, the problem, you know, coral reefs are facing a number of problems. Um, you know, they're so. I guess I should start by saying that coral reefs are built by um, tiny little animals. Um, you know, called corals, but they're really interesting creatures. They're, just, they're these very um, tiny, they're basically just like a mouth and a bunch of tentacles, and they're connected together in this, um, their tissue, they're, they're clones of each other for the most part. And so they're like this, this um, thin layer of living tissue over this calcium carbonate structure that they build, they excrete mm-hmm. that calcium carbonate. So that's what a reef is. It's all these corals, uh, you know, working together and excreting this calcium carbonate and building this structure that then is home to all these other, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of species. And they, corals actually need pretty precise conditions. They need, they need clear water, they need warm water, 
they need um, not, not a lot of nutrients in the water. So they have pretty, they're pretty picky. And we are, you know, screwing with them in all sorts of ways, nutrient runoff, turbidity in the water, pollution, you know, fertilizer, blah, blah, blah. But the sort of biggie, well, one of the biggies is climate change, because when they, they're animals, but they depend for a lot of their nutrition on these uh, symbiotic al algae. And when it gets warm, very warm, the algae, you know, go into sort of overdrive, they produce a lot of oxygen, a lot of oxygen radicals, they're very da dangerous, and the corals expel them. And that's coral bleaching, this phenomenon called coral bleaching, which people are probably familiar with. And they turn white. And if if it doesn't last too long, then they can sort of, you know, recapture their algae and 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 go on. But if it lasts a long time, they literally starve to death. So this is has really these bleaching episodes are getting they're getting more frequent, closer together, longer, blah, 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 really having a devastating impact. And people who look at the situation say, you know, coral biologists say, well, the oceans are not cooling down. That is just not happening, you know, any time in the foreseeable uh, future. So what are we going to do? How are we going to try to save these, these reefs? And one point that also should be made is that some, some corals seem to survive. So some, you know, you get a bleaching event, some corals are tougher than others. So from, mm -hmm. from this observation came this idea, could you try to sort of speed along the evolution of heat tolerance, uh, either by the corals or by their out symbionts and create tougher corals. And that is the heart of this project uh, that was run, is being run um, by Australians and Americans. And the, and the woman who is really um, this, whose brainchild it really was, um, sadly, a very dynamic woman named Ruth Gates, an English woman, um, died a few years ago. But it was really, yeah. really her brainchild. She was in Hawaii, and um, but it, it does it is being carried on now um, by people in her lab, and also by a lot of scientists in Australia. Yeah, and you, you give a quote from one of them, which I found critically uh, useful. So hopefully, the world will come to its senses soon and actually start to reduce greenhouse gases, or maybe there will be some wonderful technological invention that will solve the problem. Who knows what's going to happen? but we need to buy time. So I see assisted evolution as filling the gap, being a bridge between now and the day when we're hopefully really holding down climate change or hopefully reversing it. That's a theme that will come up again later in the book too, bridging the gap and, and, and an interesting one. But the, the, in the process, you got, to, um, um, you got to have some fun. You got to watch Coral Sex, I think, and you write a, a um, 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 I just want to, I'll write, I mean, it's a long discussion of it, but, but you say coral sex is a rare and amazing sight. On the Great Barrier Reef, it takes place once a year in November or December, shortly after a full moon. During the event called a mass spawning, billions of polyps release in synchrony, in, in synchrony tiny bead-like bundles. These bundles, which contain both sperm and eggs, float to the surface and break apart. Most of the gametes become fish food or simply drift away. The lucky ones meet a gamete of the opposite sex and produce a coral embryo. And, and, um, and you describe the experience of, of, I guess, swimming and seeing some of this. And I, I, it sounded like an amazing experience. Um, and the, but, the, but, but part of the, but there's the natural version of this, but the reason you talk about this is they've created a whole, in order to do assisted evolution, they've created a whole, once again, an artificial environment for corals where they can stress them constantly um, and, and, and then have them, and then corals have sex and then take the ones that survive and stress them and basically do what we've done in many other ways from the, from the, gener from the breeding of dogs to, 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 to what, what will be the next chapter, which will be genetic engineering, more or less engineer hardier species. Yes, the, the complexity here is we could certainly um, breed tougher corals. Um, we could breed more heat resistant corals. The question uh, would be, we, we don't breed, your dog would not survive very long uh, out in the woods. Yeah. It would, you know, definitely become not. coyote food or whatever. Yeah. 
and it wouldn't know how to fend for itself. And, you know, well, the, you know, the quarrels would have different problems, but the question is what trade-offs, you know, in that breeding are you um, making? And, you know, despite our, you know, in, immense uh, talents and, and ability now to, you know, read the genome of the coral, we don't really know. So one of the questions, you know, is, so they, what they do is they stress these corals, they, they cross them, right? They, they very carefully separate out the eggs and sperm, which are in these same little bundles. They separate them out. They cross the ones, cross them in all sorts of different ways, subject them to stress, take the tough ones and grow them up. And then you've got to take those. And this is a very, you know, many year process because corals are pretty slow growing. You put them out onto the reef, right? Like you will get like a, you know, basket of them or whatever. And you will have to put them out on the reef and see if they can make it there. So it's a very, you know, it's a great, it's a fascinating idea, but it's also very slow going to actually put it into practice. Yeah. And, and, and then there's the question of what you can do with there's there, um, uh, you you say later on in the chapter again you know presenting the positives and negatives it was hubris to imagine that people could drive the great barrier reef to collapse without suffering any consequences but wasn't it just another kind of hubris to imagine that all of the reef scale interventions and all of, so isn't that you know isn't that a kind of unrealistic and um and then you say but in the grand scheme of things artificial selection was just tinkering at the margins it was natural selection, indifferent, but infinitely patient, that had given rise to life's astonishing diversity. Um, and, 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 you know, of course, relate, you know, then you give the great quote of, Dar of the final page of Darwin's book. But suggesting, once again, that this, this technological fix um, is potentially still maybe, maybe a lost cause. In fact, you well, say... Yeah. Everyone I spoke to in Australia understood that preserving the Great Barrier Reef in all its greatness was beyond what could realistically or unrealistically be hoped for. Even settling for a tenth of it would mean shading and robotically seeding an area the size of Switzerland. What was at issue was at best a diminishing thing, a kind of okay barrier reef. If we can extend the life of the reef by 20, 30 years, that might be just enough for the world to get its act together on emissions, and it might make the difference between having nothing and having some sort of functional reef. And so it, what, what, what struck me here was, a, a, again, a theme that comes throughout. If we, first of all, the hope that this is a bridge that will be a bridge to, not to nowhere, but a bridge to a, a world where we've, we, where we've solved the other huge problem. But also the other aspect of this that comes throughout is this lack of foresight, namely, people presumably knew about the problems as they knew about climate change problems 30 years ago if those problems had been addressed i think someone even says it if 30 years ago that problem had been addressed then we'd now be talking about you know just some minor fixes to keep it going but we we didn't so maybe yeah no i i mean i think that um you know climate change is a very um you know the ultimate example of this you know we we have known about climate change for a long time, and um, we sat on our hands. And you know now, um, you know I would say now there is there is movement, but um, you know the phrase "too little, too late." And and in the meantime, there's 30 years of emissions up there, and I think that that is we'll talk about that. Has yeah. to be you know stressed. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's we'll get to that. That's the. I, I tried to stress it in my book. Uh, uh, I was going to, you know, I, I, I called it the, I don't think I called it in the book. I decided to call it the Las Vegas effect, that when it comes to carbon, what, what happens in the atmosphere stays in the atmosphere. But, um, but that, that gives the, the urgency that most people don't realize. So, so we'll, but we'll get there. I want to, I want to stay here for a moment. And I wanted to ask, um, um, you know, you certainly make it sound like at best the, the Great Barrier Reef is all, is a done deal. Well, I think once again, you know, all of these things like like people like, you know, you know, are humans going to go extinct or aren't they going to go yeah. extinct? You know, yeah. is New Orleans going to survive or isn't it going to survive? I, I strongly suspect the answer is 
you know, none of the above, you know, yeah, humans yeah. aren't going to be go extinct, but there may be a lot fewer uh, of us, you know, a hundred years from now for, for various reasons. Um, New Orleans, you know, might not be abandoned, but it may be a very different diminished place. The Great Barrier Reef may not cease to exist, but it will be a diminished place. It's already a diminished place. Yeah, it's um, okay, Barrier Reef. Fantastic yeah. place, but yeah. it's a diminished place. Let me, one thing you don't say, and it's relevant back from the, your previous book, um, presumably these, these problems, no, no matter what you do in terms of assisted evolution, if the ocean gets to 7.8 pH, there's no, th th that's, then all of this tinkering is kind of irrelevant, right? Well, I think that that even, even that would be debated, you know, once again, I mean, um, you know, there are pockets of, you know, there are corals that exist under, you know, pretty tough pH conditions there. I'm not going to get into the chemistry yeah. of it, but corals yeah. can regulate their own sure. chemistry. Yeah, to, yeah, to yeah. Extent. So, or to a, to a significant extent, certainly some people would say that's it. They're just the energetics of it are impossible. It's not happening. Um, and some people would say, well, some some species may may even be able to make it up at that time because they have certain adaptations so you know i the world is a very is a fantastically various amazing place that's what's what, what, wonderful about it um and some things will will make it they will prove more resilient than we thought and and a lot my you know once again my guess my educated guess is and a lot of things won't yeah you know actually interestingly enough when I was writing the section on acid and 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 water and well on the oceans in my book, the physics of climate change, I was talking about that you know dissolving carbonate shells by acidity and which seems to be straightforward chemistry. Turns out the chemistry isn't so straightforward. And the person who explained that to me was actually later in the book Dan Schrag, who who uh, we talk about in this book. You know, it's it's a lot more complicated than you might imagine. First and secondly, okay certain species will will die off but in fact there's great evidence that other ones will fill the evolutionary niche and so one shouldn't be you know it's 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 easy and tempting to say oh all, all hope is lost but but it's more complicated and the ability of 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 life to fill evolutionary niches is is quite extensive and so it's not yeah maybe i mean one i think move. that one thing that happens with reefs and we've we've already seen this time and time again and another thing that's happening to reefs i mean you know, being pessimistic about reefs is unfortunately just being realistic. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. disease gets them. And they are a lot of weird diseases that keep popping up. Mm -hmm. Um, that are probably linked to warming that and and their, you know, vulnerability in their immune systems that just, you know, come in and just wipe things out. Um, so the Caribbean reefs, which have been devastated by disease. Mm -hmm are in you know a shadow of their former selves yeah i go down i've done i haven't dived at the barrier reef i've dived down to the caribbean reefs and i've even seen it over the years i've been there um okay next chapter has to do with more or less genetic engineering um and and uh and engineering your way out of problems that you've created i want to preface it though by talking about saying that one, one thing people when they talk about generic gener uh, sorry genetic engineering People don't recognize that we've been doing it as long as humans have been human. Um, and, and it's not some recent, you know, CRISPR is recent and, and our ability to manipulate the genome is recent directly by, you know, molecule by molecule. But our ability to do genetic engineering has been, has been there since human civilization, since the dawn of the Anthropocene, we, if you want to call it since that. We, since we domesticated things. Well, even domestic, I would argue even going back before that. Uh, well, maybe if you want to call it, since we've domesticated plants, since mm -hmm. the dawn of yeah. agriculture that um yeah. th that that you know we've been already engineering plant varieties that we could grow as a when we went from hunting to 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 agriculture and by the way people uh, uh, this is something I, uh, someone actually I was in in a different context I, I i still don't know if i if if it's true although he argued with great assertion that it is that actually when it comes to energy in the terms of climate change the biggest mistake unintended side effect, negative unintended side effect of agriculture was the development of agriculture. They argued that agriculture is actually more in energy intensive than hunting, gathering, which I was surprised about. So if we were still hunter gatherers, we'd be expending less energy than 
So agriculture, which was a technology which solved a huge problem, uh, allowed people to stay put, nevertheless created a huge, ultimately led to a huge uh, unintended side product, which is the expenditure of energy. I thought that was kind of an interesting... Um, uh, I don't well, know if you've Jared heard that Diamond argument. Diamond has called it the biggest mistake in human history. Yeah. yeah. It, uh, um, well, one thing that it did, which is, you know, very... It, it 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 fundamentally you know we were just sort of chugging along with a, probably a pretty low you know reasonably stable population each human population as hunter gatherers once you can have agricultural surpluses you can really increase your population that puts a lot of pressures on things that didn't used to exist yeah 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 in any case this chapter is about more recent kind of efforts to genetically modify things and and solve problems and of course um I, i'm having having lived and and spent time in australia the cane toad um is the big is, is one of the greatest examples of human stupidity in terms of technological efforts to solve a problem that wasn't was only exacerbated by the problem i do love the picture you have in that book of which i said to my wife great? of that little girl with the cane toad yeah, pet so uh, it's just an amazing book picture but um anyway so that you know that's a famous yeah. well, that's a famous story cane toads were introduced to 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 solve a problem but of course they never solved the problem and all they did was reproduce like crazy and eat everything else eat it out of the way and 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 be poisonous to boot um, I don't think I want to go into detail about the cane toad problem, which is, you know, which is a problem of, of, and then the question is, how do you resolve that? Or how do you resolve the loss of chestnut trees? Or how do you resolve, how do you resolve um, uh, other invasive species, or mosquitoes, etc.? And one way out is to, is to, is to uh, engineer in a variety of ways, including their reproductive rates. So why don't you talk briefly about it, just briefly, because I want to move Yeah, on. and I think that just to answer your point before that we've been genetically, you know, manipulating things for a long time, which is certainly true. I think what's new about, you know, gene editing is this idea that we could alter things, you know, in the wild. We could yeah. we could push it out into the wild. And what's certainly new about CRISPR is now the idea of gene drive. So um you know we well, want to explain for people what a gene drive is going to ask you to do it yes, just briefly yes so so gene drive is this idea that um you know we all learned about inheritance in uh you know high school or whatever um you know you have two pea plants and you know one is white and one is red and you you cross them and the odds that any that you know you get um, the same gene from your mom and dad, you know, you all remember those little charts. Anyway, the I idea is that each parent has, a, each each offspring has a 50-50 chance of getting one of its sets of its parents' genes. Um, you know, we all have two sets from both of our parents and, you know, you mix and match and you get all sorts of different combinations and that's the miracle of sex and the miracle of, you know, nudging evolution along. But there are a lot of genes that do not play by those rules. They don't get handed down 50% of the time. They get handed down more than 50% of the time. Those exist a lot in nature. They're very clever genes. They have tricks for getting handed down more than 50% of the time. And for a long time, people have been interested in trying to harness that, what's called gene drive. Um, but it was really pretty much impossible to do before this new technology. CRISPR came along and made it possible. And now there are as we speak, uh, gene drive mosquitoes, which pass down um, basically a sort of form of self-destruction, uh, form of sterility that you could, in theory, and people have done this in, you know, like an aquarium, drive the population down to zero. And the question with these mosquitoes is, should they be released into the wild to mm -hmm. fight malaria? And that's a huge question. That's a real live question right now. Uh, and I don't know what will happen. Um, it's a really um, complicated one because, you know, people have cooked it up uh, in, the, in, you know, Europe and the U.S., mm -hmm. and they will want to release those mosquitoes in Africa. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that um, people will be very hesitant. They will be like, why do you want to release them here and not in the U.S. and in Europe? Well, and I, I mean, in some places, malaria or dengue fever, 
I mean, you know, it's yes, it, I, I agree it, it, they, that that's what that's what people will say. They will say we want to release it there because you have a lot of malaria. Yeah. But I think that there will be a lot of our resistance to that. Why are we the guinea pig? You know, our mosquitoes, the guinea pigs, as it were, even though it may be the best way to fight malaria. But I think there will be a lot of social, a lot around uh acceptance on the ground i'm not yeah. sure that will happen you know it's interesting because for me when i think about technological fixes that seems to one me to be one that is relatively cleaner what a what a wonderful way to get i mean malaria it just affects so many poor children around the world and wouldn't you want to if you could have a fix that could solve that boy or a dengue fever i mean that why especially because it, it it's poor countries where that we know which which you know, you could help a con countries that we've that that are too poor to help themselves now, or we've created poverty one way or another. And it's and then and of course the unintended side effect could be one answer the question which I've never really fully known was what on earth is the evolutionary purpose of mosquitoes? I hate mosquitoes, and I keep thinking why I don't see what good they are except maybe the spiders that are in, around can eat them every now and then. But I don't under I never knew. We'll find out, of course, if if right. they're released in Africa, oh, what their evolutionary oh, purpose sure is. I'm sure that their, uh, you know, larvae are eaten doubtless by a lot of other things. There's no food source that isn't, you know, exploited. I don't know, you know, well enough. But I also think um, another question that comes up, and this is, you know, this doesn't have to do with social acceptance. It has more to do with just efficacy. You know, it's one thing to do this in a tank. It's another thing to do it out in the wild. And evolution is um, a very powerful force. And you can evolve a species like, you know, mis Anopheles mosquitoes that are, evol you know, evolving, uh, you know, uh, mm. uh, maybe I guess they're gyptus. Anyway, mm. malaria carrying mosquitoes, mm. they are evolving, you know, really they have many generations. They're evolving fast. They can evolve resistance. And everyone knows that, you know, it's not at all clear that, um you know, once they do mate with wild wild type, they're called mosquitoes. It's not at all clear that this trait will be passed on more than 50% of the time or something, some workaround, uh, because there's such an evolutionary pressure. It's a little bit like COVID, right? If your um, reproductive success, if you're not going to reproduce unless you figure out it's, um, a workaround, then the evolutionary pressure to evolve that work around is extremely high. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the question of what to do or not to do, again, you address, the, I just want to read the last few paragraphs of that chapter because I found it. Um, anyway, in the 1950s, Hawaii's Department of Agriculture decided to control giant African snails, which had been introduced two decades earlier as garnet ornaments by importing rosy wolf snails, which are also known as cannibal snails. The cannibal snails mostly left the giant snails alone. Instead, they ate their way through dozens of species in a, of a wise, small, endemic land snails, producing what E.O. Wilson has called an extinction avalanche. Responding to Brand, Wilson has, Wilson has observed, we are not gods. We're not yet sentient or intelligent enough to be much of anything. Paul Kingsnorth, a British writer and activist, has put it this way, we are as gods, but we fail to get good at it. We are Loki, killing the beautiful for fun. We are Saturn, devouring our children. Kingsworth has also noted, sometimes doing nothing is better than doing something. Sometimes it is the other way around. And I guess that's the conundrum, right? I mean, do you, do you, do you, if you could see a technological fix, do you say, gee, we don't know what its implications are, or, or do you do it? And I think, um, I think the natural tendency, of course, and my own feeling is to explore all the possible solutions and be careful about what you do to make sure that they might not run out of control, which takes us actually to the last two, uh, actually the three sections of the book, which I want to cover um, um, and ha having to do with the, the deeper question of carbon, of, 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 uh, of global climate change. And, um, and you start uh, talking about a, a place that now is near and dear to my heart because I visited as well, Climeworks. Um, in Iceland, which is trying to capture carbon. And and I think it's evolved since you wrote, I think it's now called carb fix. Um, uh, and, and when I was that, there, that's the, um, that's the Icelandic sort of scientific piece of it. Yeah. Is carb fix. yeah. Yeah. That's where we visit. I visited when we, our last trip and the idea is ultimately 
as we have as we've alluded to and it's important to reiterate this is that is that the problem with climate change is not the urgency is not that everyone's going to die in 12 years as some activists unfortunately including some in the congress keep saying it's not that it's not that if we don't do anything we'll or your children will be dead in five years or 10 years or 15 years is it, it is that every year we wait it becomes harder to solve the problem because we put 10 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere that weren't there before half of which stay in the atmosphere half of which go in the oceans um uh, for the most part um and 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 that cumulative effect means that had we just think about it had we done it 10 years ago there'd be 100 billion tons of carbon that we wouldn't have had to deal with now so that's a problem and that adds to the urgency but it's made people realize that one of the possible solutions and an obvious one which would take which which has the advantage of not producing a world that we don't that we've never experienced before rather producing a world that we once experienced and that is to remove the carbon we're pretty sure of what would happen if we remove the carbon it would take us back to where the the situation that we've all experienced in the beginning of the industrial era of, of humanity so people have talked about removing carbon and and um and 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 your next chapter is about various challenges and ways of trying to remove carbon interestingly enough actually by the way you, you get it with that with klaus lochner and i i think the reason i this interested me is that i'm trying to remember when you came to visit me uh, in phoenix but for an event which but i think at that event was also wally bruckner brooker who's who was a giant in climate change um uh, effort one of the first people to really point out climate change from from Lamont uh, in Colombia, and actually at that event, I th I don't know if it was, but we ran an event on climate change. I don't maybe. think it was because it I, wasn't I on that. Only once, maybe yeah. maybe okay. In any case, we ran an event on on climate change, and one of the one of the ultimate things we decided, and we produced a white paper, was that we needed at least research should go into carbon capture and and sequestration because so much little was so much. So little was being spent on it by comparison to anything else with such, you know, positive potential playoffs. And one of the things was to, and I was happy to say, was to, was to um, recruit Klaus Lochner to ASU where I work. So, and, and he wrote, you, you met him and talked to him when he was there. But um, um, the, the, um, but as he, you know, and so it looks, so, so there's, there's a few, radical climate solutions that are in this part of, of of your book and the first one is is less radical which is climate change and 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 uh, which is carbon capture i mean and um and i think as i think it's lochner who said this yes people have fundamentally altered the atmosphere and yes this is likely to lead to all sorts of dreadful consequences but people are ingenious we come back to this again they come up with crazy big ideas and sometimes they actually work. These actually work. Although in your book, it's it's a story of mixed <laughs> results, I think. But his at least optimism that they might work. Um, and so, so the question is, uh, what's your impression of of the, of 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 carbon capture? I, I mean, it's a lovely idea. It just seems like it just seems like uh, apple pie and impossible to in in not not that the chemistry is impossible, but the scale of the problem. Is difficult to address and so i wanted to ask you about that well there's there's so much to say about carbon um capture or really carbon dioxide removal as i yeah, suppose yeah yeah mm -hmm. um and you know one thing is you know yes it's great it's 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 really necessary you know it's it's built into a lot of the models any model any model that says we can still keep uh climate you know, temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees. Basically, they all have a lot of carbon dioxide removal built into them um, yeah. already. Yeah. That's a kind of people don't realize that, but they're yeah. all. Let me let me interrupt you for a second because I was going to yeah. let me read quote you yeah. on this and yeah. that very fact. Um, all all of uh, all of which make negative emissions an idea which is at least resistible, irresistible. The extent to which humanity is already counting on them is illustrated by the latest report of the International intergovernmental panel on climate change published uh, in the run-up to paris to peer into the future the ipcc relies on computer models that represent the world's economic and energy systems as a tangle of equations the output of these models is then translated into figures that climate scientists can use to forecast 
how much temperatures are going to rise. Um, for its report, they consider more than a thousand scenarios. The majority of these led to temperatures increases beyond the official two degrees Celsius disaster threshold and some to warming as much as five degrees Celsius. Just 116 scenarios were consistent with holding warming under two degrees Celsius. And of these, 101 involved negative emissions. Um, following Paris, that, that, that produced another report based on a 1.5 degrees threshold. All of these are, con uh, um, are consistent with the goal relied, all of these that were consistent with the goal relied on negative emissions. And what Klaus said is, I think what the IPPC, IPCC is really is saying is, we tried lots and lots of scenarios, and of the scenarios which stayed safe, virtually every one needed some magic touch of negative emissions. If we don't do that, we ran into a brick wall. Yeah, so that that's the sort of, um, you know, situation that we're starting from. So, you know, negative emissions are this technology that that we really need, that we're counting on. But as you say, that it's not clear scale wise that we can really do. We we can do it. You and I both visited um, this installation in Iceland where a company called Climeworks uses these chemicals to to soak CO2 out of the atmosphere and then because of Iceland's interesting geology, they sh they shove it way, you know, very deep underground, a mile underground, and, and it um, under pressure and heat and with a lot of water, it um, gets converted to calcium carbonate, and that is the fate of of all of our carbon emissions over many millions of years. It will get converted into carb calcium carbonate, but uh, here we're trying to speed things up, you know, by a factor of hundreds of thousands and. The, the difficulty here, well, they're twofold. First of all, it takes energy. Carbon, um, mm. you know, d doesn't, uh, you know, to react, to make these chemicals that will react, all these things take energy. So you're taking energy that um, is precisely our problem, that we make emissions with energy. So you need a lot of carbon-free energy. And then the second problem, uh, which is related to the first, is you, you need to do this at a huge scale and you need somewhere to put the carbon. So I guess there are three things. You need the energy, the carbon free energy to get the carbon out of the air. You need a place to put it and you need to do that on the billions of tons per year uh, scale. And that, you know, the biggest operation that's going right now is the Climeworks operation in Iceland. That's 4,000 tons a year. Okay. Now you scale that up to 10 billion tons a year and you, you see the order of magnitude problem. Yeah, I mean, it's not the the when you see the, this operation, you see that in it in order of magnitude, it's not that much different than the amount of carbon I save by my solar panels on on my house. And and yeah, and, and it's and 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 then there's the issue. Um, optimistically, the goal that's often claimed is in cost is one hundred dollars a ton, which is pie in the sky right now no one has no one knows a way to do this for a hundred dollars a ton nobody but that's the right. goal but if you do that and you say let's say we want to we want to remove the 10 billion tons per year much less you know reduce it so we've got to we've got to we've got to be taking away as much as we're producing or more that's a trillion dollars a year besides the fact well, that you might have to instrument an area the size of texas um and well, and me, so let me give, and it's not my job, not my usual role to be more optimistic, but but right. I think that no one would say, um, you know, we're going to take out 10 billion tons a year. They would say, uh, we're going to try to, you know, dramatically reduce our carbon emissions, but there are always going to be carbon emissions. Um, and we need some way to take care of those because we need to get to net zero. So this yeah. is part of a effort, a many, many multifaceted effort to get to net zero. Now, I think the problem is um, the, the first part of that equation, you know, is is getting close enough to net zero so that carbon dioxide removal makes sense. Yeah. I, I, okay. And it's a really good point to make. I was actually going to come back and argue against myself in this regard too, <laughs> in the same sense that it used to be that a trillion dollars was a lot of money and one has seen, I mean, so let's say it's only a hundred billion. It does a lot of money, but we've seen already uh, with the pandemic and with ridiculous military uh, incursions, we're already seeing hundreds of billions of dollars applied to those very short-term problems, if you want to call it that. And so yeah. um, that kind of money, when you consider the ultimate 
result is is in some ways an earth that at least can function similarly to the way we function now maybe a hundred billion dollars or trillion is not is not so outrageous to think about especially when you divide it around the whole developed world at least um and and yeah and i mean you know the other thing that and anyway we we should we should move on because i yeah. know that yeah, yeah i know but... i want to i want to get i'm gonna we'll go about <laughs> ten, we'll go if it's okay with you we'll go about 10 minutes longer sure. so 10 or 15 but then we'll go you know but, one of the things that's often talked about i'll just mention it because i'm sure many, most of your listeners have heard about it, is okay we're gonna we're gonna remove carbon dioxide with trees you know we're just yeah. gonna plant trees and i think that that is um, a lot more appealing in a lot of ways, but I think it's also important to understand the limitation of trees. They they grow uh, very slowly. They take up carbon very slowly, um, and they when they die, Not when they, they die, get that they back up. So um, you know, there's been a lot of. I mean, I I love trees. Trees are great. We should be reforesting. You know, everywhere mm. we can. But there's been a lot of hype about how much carbon you can offset with trees and that's going to be a huge thing around net zero if we ever get close which you know god knows we're actually getting farther every year and emissions yeah. are upping it this year but yeah. you know oh if i plant a tree is that going to offset my emissions no it's not yeah yeah i know in fact i'm always disturbed in my solar panels they always show me how many effectively trees i have planted and i just wish they wouldn't wouldn't do that but you all do talk another way besides carbon to remove carbon, which is to grow things. And and you talk about this plant that makes tomatoes. And the ant last again, I'll read the last paragraph of that chapter. From li- more than for more little bricks of dirt, cherry tomato plants stretch to the roof in helical coils. The tomatoes, just a day or two from harvest, were perfect in that greenhouse tomato sort of way. Russer picked a couple and handed them to me. The burning trash, the acres of glass, the boxes of bumblebees, the vegetables raised on chemicals and captured CO2. Was it all totally cool or totally crazy? Question mark. I paused for a second and then popped the tomatoes in my mouth. <laughs> Once again, raising the question, then moving on to something else. Okay. The next thing is, uh, the last two things are, are, are uh, the next thing is, is the other solution, which is, I think, inevitable in my own opinion, which is geoengineering, solar geoengineering. Um, uh, I used to be an, an opponent. I actually think on a radio program once, I may have debated David Keith on that program. I think it might have been um, Science Friday years ago. Before I kind of knew better, the person who changed my mind here again was Dan Schrag at Harvard, who you talk about in this chapter. But, but why don't you talk about briefly the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of solar geoengineering, and then we'll I have one question, and then we'll move on to the end. Okay, so solar geoengineering refers to this idea that we will um, offset, counteract um, uh, the effect of dumping a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere by dumping a lot of reflective particles into the stratosphere. That's the only idea people have really come up with so far to um, reflect sunlight back to space. And that has a cooling effect, literally less direct sunlight hitting the earth. And that could potentially counteract some of our CO2. And this idea comes from volcanoes, which produce a lot of sulfur dioxide and do have a cooling effect. Uh, you know, Mount Pinatubo, when that erupted, um, global temperatures dropped by like half a degree for around a year. So the idea is we'll have we'll have these planes. They'll be injecting a lot of sulfur dioxide or something else reflective in the stratosphere. They'll have to keep keep on doing this all year after year after year, um, and we will uh, counteract some of our some. I don't think anyone would advocate counteracting all of it. Mm-hmm. Very dangerous, but maybe we could, as they say, take the top off the curb here. And um, I also. Um, I don't think it's inevitable, but I think it's inevitable that we're going to be sucked into a long uh, debate about it um, because, you know, as um, Frank Koich, who's a chemist at Harvard, a very smart guy, runs Harvard Solar Geoengineering Research Program, uh, pointed out, we are not doing anything or not doing nearly enough about climate change. So we're never escaping from under this idea of is there something else that we could do when the you know when the proverbial shit hits the fan um and when the shit hits the fan 
you know, if there's something, if something terrible happens, you know, you're getting crop failure, yeah. there's no quick answer. And, and, and Frank's point was, look, there's only one thing you can do on a fairly short time scale, and that is solar geoengineering. And that's what makes it so dangerous, so attractive, so crazy, so scary. Um, but another point that I should make is this is purely theoretical. No one's done the slightest you know, because it's so controversial. No one's well, it's done not this. purely theoretical. I mean, the, the example of what happened with volcanoes and as, as gives some evidence that, you know, you cool. Yes, <laughs> right. But, you know, it's hard to mimic a volcano. It's not yeah, that easy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty it's hard. A lot of power there, yeah. And, well, but you hit, let me add to the advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. And I, I don't know, again, if it was Dan who first explained this to me or made me think about it. The advantage, you see, the problem with climate change is that you have to have a this global, you know, reducing our carbon emissions is a global contract. And humanity right. has never done a global contract. And as far as I can see, there's no evidence we can. We keep trying, right. but then we don't. We talk and don't do anything. Right. And right. so, but the advantage of, of ge solar geoengineering is also its disadvantage, is that you don't have to do it. One country can choose to do it. One country can say, well, um, you know, we're going to take it on uh, on ourselves. And that's that's an advantage, but it's also a worry, right? Because you don't have, if China decides that's what they want to do, they're going to do it. And there's, and there's no, and you don't have any say in it if you're, it, uh, and so. Well, you do if you're at an Air Force. I mean, I think that that is, is exaggerated. And I believe it was probably Dan Schrag who pointed this out to me. I mean, if you, if the world's most powerful countries with the world's most powerful mm -hmm. Air Forces all agreed to do it, they could do it. Yeah. But if China decided to do it, you could shoot them down, you know, so, well, so I don't then, think yeah, you got it. Yeah, but you, you could. Well, it's easy to say that. But 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 um, shooting them down is, a, is another whole other can of worms. Right. I mean, the point well, is. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that I think that the idea that one country is going to do it in a rogue way, you know, I mean, maybe if the world is a different place and falling apart, you know, even more than it is right now. But I do think it's something that a group of countries, a group could of do. very powerful countries, uh, could decide to do. And you but, could decide to do it for twenty billion dollars or something like that per year or something. Yeah, no, it, it's, it, it's a minuscule amount of money in, in the global scheme. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and the, you know, one one of the many things that prevents, um, might prevent that and might you know cause or might not prevent it, but might cause terrible global strife is that, you know, we don't know if you counteract, you know, if you get, if you have, you know, two degrees C of warming, yeah. one degree C of cooling, you yeah. don't get a one degree warmer yeah. world. Yeah. You get this weird world yeah. where God knows what happens to regional weather patterns, yeah. God knows what happens to the monsoons. Yeah. So you're going to have huge geopolitical um, tensions over that. But, you know, there's two, let me, yes, I agree. But let me give the two, another positive, which we keep calling Dan, but again, uh, the reason, what turned me around was the realization that the the unknowns that you point out are severe unknowns. But the really good thing about, about aerosols is unlike carbon, they have a half-life of a year or so. So if you, if you put these things and you see bad things happen, you have a year of, or two of bad things. You don't have a century or a millennium. And that is certainly, certainly a, a, a real positive, a real, for me, heartening enough to make me think that at least on some small scale, the experiment may be worth, worth doing. Um, the other one is, is an argument you quote from David Keith, who says, uh, Keith believes the world will eventually cut its carbon emissions, if not all the way down to zero, then close to it. He also believes carbon removal technologies can eventually be scaled up to take care of the rest. But all this quite possibly will not be enough. During the period of overshoot, and in all these models, even the ones that that have, um, you know, that ha keep us to two degrees or 1.5 degrees C, there's this period of overshoot where you go above and you come back down. During the period of overshoot, a great many people will suffer and, and changes that are, for all intents and purposes, irreversible may occur, like the demise of the Great Barrier Reef. So the idea is that, first of all, it's only in there a year or two. Secondly, this may and secondly as you point out it works quickly it's not a 20-year thing you put it up there it has an immediate effect and thirdly it may it may address the problems that can't be addressed otherwise because of overshoot 
Right. But I just do want to say that that is a, you know, we're not talking about a year. I mean, yeah. any, any scenario over sure we're talking about a minimum of decades. Yes. And with very, um, you know, so one of the many, many, and there are many, many ethical arguments against geoengineering is you're, you're basically committing future generations. Now, yeah. of course, we're committing future generations to warming. But as David Keith, who is also at Harvard and is really the key person in this whole yeah. field, he would not say he advocates geoengineering, but he's certainly the key advocate of research on geoengineering. Um, as he uh, himself pointed out to me, there's a difference between something you've done you know, blundered into like climate change and something that you consciously decided to do like geoengineering, those do have different ethical bars as it were. Uh, yeah, they certainly do. And, and, um, but you know, I, uh, I will at least now quote Shrag directly in your book. He said, people have to get their, <laughs> people have to get their heads away from thinking about whether they like solar geoengineering or not, whether they think it should be done or not. They have to understand that we don't get to decide. The United States doesn't get to decide your world leader and there's a technology that could take the pain and suffering away or take some of it away, you've got to be really tempted. I'm not saying they'll do it tomorrow. I feel like we might have 30 years. The highest priority for scientists is to figure out all the different ways this could go wrong. And one of the ways that it won't go wrong, but of course relates to the title of the book, which I had never really realized, is the following paragraph. The more particles injected into the stratosphere, the greater the chance of weird side effects. Researchers who looked into using solar geoengineering to offset carbon dioxide levels of 560 parts per million, levels that could easily be reached later in the century, determined it would change the appearance of the sky. White would become the new blue. The effect they noted would cause the sky over formerly pristine areas to look similar to the sky over urban areas. Another more felicitous result they observed would be glorious sunsets, similar to those seen after large volcano kind of corruptions. The title of your book, Under a White Sky. So the question is, do we want to, do we want to get rid of the, do you want children to say, what's that blue in that painting, mom? What, 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 why were they skating the sky blue? Boy, that seems an awful thing to think that our children might see white skies. Okay, last, last section has to do with, again, a place that is of great, I don't know what, personal interest to me because it's Greenland and Camp Century and, 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 and the, um, um, uh, the the fact of what's happening in Greenland and and uh, and you talk about this this camp that was built for for actually for military purposes but had a side benefit which was to to allow ultimately allow scientists as a front to to dig a to dig a, a an ice core and ice cores have turned out to be for us an amazing source of information I talk a great deal about them in my last book by the way did you know uh, you probably know this you talk about Willie Dansgaard in your book. Who's the, who's the sort of dean of ice cores when they first started getting done and used and used the military industrial complex as, to allow him to do science that you wouldn't do otherwise. But I, one thing I have to tell you, because I did, studied this for, for the lectures I gave in Greenland, you, the first people to do ice cores was actually a, one of my scientific heroes, Alfred Wegener in Greenland, who was of course the, also the father of climate change. He died in the process, but he was the first one to suggest that these might be useful to to uh, as a way to probe the past and what these uh, ice uh, cores sorry go on no there's there's a you know Wigner as you know Wigner died on the on the ice sheet yes and he is um somewhere on uh, you know somewhere and once I uh there there were when one of the trips I took to Greenland they the guys were always joking oh that you know they were no oh, that they were going to come across his body you know eventually his body will be yeah uh, you know, coming he'll be travel across the coast from west to east and come out these and when i was there by the way one of the one of the scientists there well, well one of the speakers it wasn't quite a scientist had said actually he discovered in the ice um uh um one of the one of the objects that was in a, in a picture that was taken of Wegener there so some of the objects are already coming out and so it's it's a um, it's remarkable, but one of the things that came out of that is incredibly sobering. And that is that, you know, for people who say, oh, it can't happen or dramatic things can't happen. Certainly, and uh, there was a time in, in, in recent times in the history of Greenland where not only did the Greenland ice sheet disappear, but more importantly, temperatures changed over the period of centuries or less by eight to 14 degrees and fluctuated back and forth. And, oh, and this was so surprising when it was seen in the first ice cores 
that other ones had to be seen. And over and over and over again, it's been validated. No one quite knows how those rapid fluctuations happen, but they would be devastating if they happened. And, uh, and that is enough to cause, you know, I often like to use the example of, um, of Dirty Harry. You, said, Do you feel lucky, punk? Um, and, <laughs> yeah. and so we don't know. There are a lot of risks about what might happen in Greenland. And a lot of people say, well, there's so much uncertainty. But it seems to me, if, if there's that much uncertainty and, that, and not only the, the likelihood, the possibility of wild fluctuations of 8 to 14 degrees, then we should, those uncertainties should drive us to action more than if they didn't exist in the first place. If that kind of extreme thing is a possibility, then risk analysis would suggest that you at least take that option in, in, in terms of what you're doing globally. But I well, was surprised. That, it, Sorry, go yeah. on. No, that brings us back to the famous Wally Broker quote. Wally Broker came up before, uh, climate yeah. is an angry beast and we are poking it with a stick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But I, I was intrigued that you made your own, uh, there was, uh, you didn't interpret it that way, but you talked to a climate scientist or someone looking at this, the, the ice course, and came up with your own sort of technological fix to a problem and he shot you right down. You said, I brought up the issue of climate change. Perhaps I suggested, hopefully, it would ward off another ice age and more DO events. At least we could dodge that particular disaster. And immediately you got shot down. He said he was unimpressed by my suggestion. He pointed out that if you believe the climate to be inherently unstable, the last thing you want to do is mess around with it. He recited an old Danish saying whose pertinence I didn't entirely understand, but which nonetheless stuck with me. He translated it as pissing in your pants will only keep you warm for so long. Yeah, that's, that's a great one. I often use that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and that brings us Really, I, you know, you talk about interfering with glaciers and 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 um, um, and, um, uh, and and then you basically say at the end, and I want to read the last part of your book, um, the last a few quotes from the last part of your book. Um, you know, after you talk about first you speed up an ice cream by melting and then you try to slow it down by erecting 300 foot tall, three mile long concrete top topped embankments. You say, this has been a book about people trying to solve problems created by people trying to solve problems. In the course of reporting it, I spoke to engineers and genetic engineers, biologists, microbiologists, atmospheric scientists, and atmospheric entrepreneurs. Without exception, they were enthusiastic about their work. But as a rule, this enthusiasm was tempered by doubt. And I jumped down. It's in this context that interventions like assisted evolution and gene drives and digging millions of trenches to bury billions of trees have been assessed. Geoengineering may be entirely crazy and quite disconcerting, but it could slow the melting of the Greenland ice sheet or take some of the pain and suffering away or help prevent no longer fully natural ecosystems from collapsing. Doesn't have to be considered. Andy Parker is the director for the Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative, which works to expand the global conversation around geoengineering. His preferred analogy, drug analogy for the technology is chemotherapy. No one in his right mind would undergo chemotherapy where better options available. We live in a world, he has said, where deliberately dimming the blank sun might be less risky than not doing it. But to imagine that dimming the blank sun could be, and I use an F word there, could be less dangerous than not dimming it, you have to imagine not only that the technology will work according to plan, but also that it will be deployed according to plan. And that's a lot of imagining. As Koich, Keith, and Schrag all pointed out to me, scientists can only make recommendations. Implementation is a political decision. You might hope that such a decision would be made equitably with respect to those alive today and to future generations, both human and non-human. But let's just say the record here isn't strong. Suppose that the world or a small group of assertive nations launch a feat of sales, that's a geoengineering term, which we didn't get into here, but it doesn't matter. And suppose that even as the sails are flying and lofting more and more tons of particles, global emissions continue to rise. The result would not be a return to the climate of pre-industrial days or to that of the Pliocene or even the Eocene, where crocodiles basked on Arctic shores. It would be an unprecedented climate for an unprecedented world where, where silver carp glisten under a white sky. So I, I, and you say in your epilogue, 
Recent books about the environment, which tend to be not exactly painful, then at least gloomy, usually end with what I would call the additional three pages. And I think my book, by the way, is one of them. After driving just how bad things are for insects and orangutans or ice caps or the planet in general, the author explains where there's reason for optimism. Often the final chapter includes steps for the concerned reader to take. Plant native trees, ride a bike, take to the streets, or if all else fails, you camp to Mars. The last impression left is, if not exactly upbeat, then at least unpleasant. I'd like to end it that way, but I can't. And because, because implicit in all of these things is that is, is the complexity of the natural environment. And your book is all about the fact that technological solutions need to be explored, but it's hard to envisage all of the results of them. And, and, and are you, so I wanna end with the question from my brother-in-law, John Dahl, who asked, I guess my one question for Elizabeth would be if she felt any sadness or pessimism when she wrote her book, or does she merely feel a sense of joy in alluding to her own species short spotlight in the sun? <laughs> so why don't you answer it and we'll close on that. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, terrible pathos. And yeah. Um, I mean, I see the book as a very, you know, dark comedy, um, but it certainly, um, you know, in the course of reporting it, um, it, you know, it was often, you know, just, just dark. How's that? I tried to write yeah. it as a dark comedy, but, um, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of darkness to what we're doing to the world. Yeah. But at the same time, I think the new book at least points out that there are a lot of people who are working hard to try to be ingenious. And some of those things may Yes, absolutely. Pay off. absolutely. And I think, I mean, it's really important to point out. I think the book, while it's a testimony to the dangers of screwing with Mother Nature, it nevertheless is testimony to the ingenuity and, and perspicacity and, and, and endurance and, and, and drive of humans to keep trying. And even that problem doesn't work, try another one. So, yes. And that's why I, 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 I mean, I think that even optimism and pessimism are probably the wrong words, you know, dichotomy is I think that you know, there's, you know, big trouble, you know, co coming at us. And, and, and increasingly that's apparent and increasingly in a lot of places already there. Um, but the answer isn't, not the answer, the, the end result isn't, you know, it's not going to be this, you know, it's not going to be doom and it's not going to be, um, you know, solution. It's going to be something a lot messier. The future will be messy. I It'll guess be I different, and 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 none of us. And 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 in a sense, that's a cause for pessimism. But for me, it's also a cause for optimism in my own life. The the realization that I don't know what I'll be doing in three years, or what the world will be doing in three years, is a source of concern, but also wonder. Because gosh, it'd be a boring world if we knew. But the future it's not going to be boring i can yeah. guarantee you that yeah and, and and as you know from the jewish expression god lord protect us from an interesting life or whatever yeah um, exactly well look but on the other hand you know i wrote my last sentence i think in my last book was fortune favors the prepare mind and we are all blessed and i'm certainly am but i think all of us are blessed by you're helping to prepare our minds with your wonderful books and it's always it's, it's always enlightening and a pleasure to spend time and talk to you. And I think this has been, I'm just so pleased we had this chance to go do a deep dive into, into, uh, into your book and into your ideas. And I look forward to, um, to uh, being with, on Galapagos with you in a year. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. This podcast is produced by the Origins Project Foundation, a nonprofit organization whose goal is to enrich your perspective of your place in the cosmos by providing access to the people who are driving the future of society in the 21st century and to the ideas that are changing our understanding of ourselves and our world. To learn more, please visit originsprojectfoundation.org.